Um, welcome to the July 30th, 2020 Hadley School Committee meeting. And it's great to see everybody here. Um, may I have a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll just ask real quick. I'm not seeing who Mary yet in the attendee list, but uh, when we see her show up, maybe Corey, if you uh, catch her on there, or Annie, if you could just let us know, that'd be great. Thank you. Great. So uh, thank you again for joining. Uh, I do have just a couple opening remarks I'd like to make before we open up public comment. Um, for public comment, we do have a, a policy around public comment, and we do want to uh, stick to that policy for tonight, which really uh, we recapped in our last meeting, uh, and it is available on the district website as well for you. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from all of you, but we also want to make sure that we give uh, we adhere to the policy, which is a three-minute uh, policy, in order that we may hear from all of you. Uh, and not necessarily be here through uh, till midnight. <laughs> so this is the the public participation public comment policy. Um, we will ask that you uh, when you uh, are we are opening up public comment that if you would like to speak that you would raise your digital hand. Uh, there's a blue hand in here that you can raise. Uh, and for anybody who is not connected on the WebEx via computer, uh, we'll just need to know by phone if you would like to make comment and then we'll call on you. I will go through the order. Um, I will keep a three minute timer uh, in order for you to present your material. Um, generally, we don't uh, respond to Q&A during a public comment. It is an opportunity for you to share with us um, your feedback, your thoughts, uh, and your considerations about the material that we are going to be deliberating tonight. Um, before we go into public comment, a couple things I'd just like to really thank. Um, there's a lot of people to thank here. There's uh, all of the teachers, um, all of the staff, the administration, Superintendent uh, Annie McKenzie, um, and this school committee. You have worked um, tirelessly to draft um, material which has really been our charge. Our charge has to be to come up with three plans, uh, regardless of which plan is ultimately uh, selected in the future, which will not be tonight, but regardless of what that selection is, we still are charged with coming up with three plans. Um, so folks on this line, myself included, may have strong feelings about one plan over another, um, we're not here tonight to debate that. What we're here to talk through is each of those three plans um, because we need to ultimately develop an in-person plan, a hybrid plan, and a completely online plan, regardless of which one you may favor over another. Those plans ultimately do have to be submitted to the state. Um, so while, again, our charge is not to select a plan tonight, um, we are charged with reviewing those plans, hearing input from you, um, and uh, all of your input today in the public comment and through the emails that you have sent into the district that we wanna take all of that into consideration. Um, if there are still lingering questions, we wanna be sure that we can address those or acknowledge where we may not know. Um, next week, we will vote on uh, the, the final plans for each of those three. So we're still even next week not choosing one out of those three plans, but what we are doing is voting into and approving those three plans that we're required to have in place. Um, and again, Annie will recap this and I'll draw your attention when we get to it um, on page three, I believe it is of the uh, draft district um, uh, plan. It has a, a great chart with the timeline um, and just to reinforce that we do not determine what that final go forward decision is until later in August. Uh, so with that framing in mind, I just I wanted to make sure that there was um, clarity about what we are and are not um, deliberating and, and determining tonight. But I really look forward to the dialogue. I look forward to hearing from each of you. Um, and ultimately, I just want to close this with thanking uh, the public for continuing to dialogue with us for having um, uh, respectful collegial uh, discussions about these plans and the questions and concerns that you have. I'm a parent, I get it, I have questions as well. Uh, I think everybody on this committee, uh, we all have children in the school system and uh, you know we all have questions as well, so we're in it together. 
Um, with that, let me just ask any of the other committee members uh, here tonight if you have any opening remarks you'd like to make before we go into public comment. This is Paula. I don't, Heather, I thought you covered it well. Thank you. Same, Heather. Same for me. Thank you, Heather. You are welcome. Great. Thank you. Hi, Humera. Glad I see you here. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, we're going to move to uh, topic two on the agenda, which is the public comment. Looking forward to this. Can I? Um, I'm so Andy, sorry, Heather. I, I believe my error that there should be an adjustment to the agenda that the public comment would follow the presentation so people could hear the presentation. So my error there that the public. Oh, I apologize. Okay. <laughs> So the adjustment to the agenda is to move the public comment. And actually that, that may be very helpful because as part of the presentations, questions may be answered that you uh, have. So we'll give folks an opportunity to present the plans to talk through that. So we'll just do uh, 4A, uh, correct? And then we'll move back to public comment and then we'll move back into 4B as a presentation topic. Okay. All right, then Annie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, I too would like to thank all the folks that have helped with this. And so that includes a reopening team that included representation from our educators and the Happy Education Association, um, our administrators, and our school nurses. And we got input from people in transportation, from facilities, from school committee members, from food services, many people who are here this evening, many teachers who emailed, gave suggestions, asked questions, and thank you so much to all of the parents who emailed and asked excellent questions, and those questions helped us to create a stronger and more robust plan, and hopefully we've answered a lot of those questions. So just to restate what Heather has said, that uh, what were we charged with? We were charged with developing plans that demonstrated an understanding of what it means to reduce risk when you reopen school buildings. We were not charged with deciding in July if we should reopen school buildings. We were charged with developing plans and plans that, that would respond responsibly to three very likely scenarios. One scenario is students returning to in-person learning. Another scenario would be needing to go entirely online because community transmission or statewide transmission rates dictated that. And another scenario would be the need for a hybrid plan. Our need for a hybrid plan in Hadley is different than what perhaps you've heard from, from other districts. So we were charged with developing a plan that I'll say again, demonstrates that we understand what it means to reduce risk, not eliminate, that's impossible, but to reduce risk when reopening school buildings. The school committee then evaluates the plan to determine the extent to which that understanding is evident throughout the plan, that what we're suggesting demonstrates that understanding of what it means to reduce risk, and that we have plans to respond to three likely scenarios. We were also charged with, in, when we do in-person learning, for purposes of equity to come up with plans that have the, the maximum possible students that we could have in in-person learning and do that safely. So the first charge, do we understand what it means to reduce risk? And we have taken our understanding not only from the guidance that's been issued from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, from CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, from the Department of Public Health, um, other medical journals, but also we relied heavily on a report from the Harvard School of Public Health, which is specifically about reducing risk when reopening schools. If you could just hold on one second. Um, um, they're picking up all that noise. Thanks. Annie, may I interject one thing as well? I, I would just like to acknowledge that our student representative, Jack Kelly, has also joined us. Um, Jack Kelly has so graciously offered to serve as a student representative 
uh, alongside the school committee. And we also value his insight. And uh, Jack, I appreciate that you are able to join us tonight. Um, and so we do uh, see that you are here. And so when we do uh, have the committee discussion, uh, we would welcome your participation in that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I figured this was a pretty important one to uh, have a student representative on. If, if it was going to be any of them, it would be this one. Yes, so. we appreciate it. Back to you, Annie. Thank you for being here, Jack. I appreciate it as well. So we relied heavily on the report from the Harvard School of Public Health that focuses entirely on reducing risk when reopening schools. So our understanding of what it means to reduce risk is that number one, we layer defenses. You've probably heard this from the CDC, from DPH, you've heard this repeatedly. There is no one single mitigation strategy that will effectively, there is no one that will eliminate transmission and there is no one that will um, effectively single-handedly single slow transmission. So layering defenses means that we need to create healthy classrooms, healthy buildings, healthy activities, healthy schedules, shared responsibility, and limit transmission chains. So in every time we were looking at a plan, that's what we were trying to achieve. And we evaluated the details of each recommendation in light of those criteria espoused by the Harvard School of Public Health. When we talk about creating healthy classrooms, you'll see in our plans that we are asking not only uh, did we implement the recommendation that all students in grades two through 12 and all staff would wear masks when they were at school, we are also asking the school committee, what we have in our plan is that all students, unless there is a medical exemption or a, for reasons of disability impact, that all students, and all staff would wear masks when they are physically present. We focus on hand hygiene, and you'll see that both of the school plans and the details of the plans will be presented by each of the principals, but you'll see in, in both school plans an emphasis on providing opportunities throughout the day for students to practice hand hygiene, washing their hands frequently, access to hand sanitizer, as well as um, uh, other uh, other hygiene practices. Physical distance. Initially, when the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education issued its guidance, they indicated that distances of one meter provided benefits. However, it was very important to our staff, and um, we share this concern, that physical distancing was at two meters or six feet just slightly below two meters, that we, that to every extent possible, that we organize spaces to allow for six feet of physical distancing. And also we focus on cohorts, for, and a cohort means that students remain in the same group throughout the day. In our in-person plan, we, we have, establish phases for that plan. I would say that in this regard, our plan is unique. And at this point, I would say, unlike any other that I've seen in the Commonwealth. Well, there has been some discussion about phasing re-entry. We worked very hard to say, how do we phase reopening? And how do we gradually increase movement, allowable movement, so move students gradually out of cohorts and allow for cohort mixing, how do we do that responsibly and over time? How we decided to do that in our plan, in our in-person plan, is we decided to do that in phases. And each phase of our in-person plan, which how it looks at each school, again, the principals will speak after I do and walk you through how it looks in their particular school. But in general, in the district for in-person learning, when we're talking about phases, each phase for in-person would last a minimum of six weeks. We determine the length of phases after speaking directly to Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen is the principal investigator on the reducing risk when reopening schools report. 
from Harvard School of Public Health. He suggested that a phase, if we wanted to be conservative, would be two virus cycles, roughly six weeks. So each phase is a minimum of six weeks. In the first phase of in-person learning, all students across the district would be able to come to school five days a week. They would, we would be able to space them six feet apart. Every student would be dismissed two hours early, Monday through Friday. In phase two, we add one day of full in-person learning. So Monday becomes a full day. Phase two and also Monday, students, and this is particularly relevant at Hopkins Academy, students are able to follow a regular schedule and groups can mix. In phase three, we add another full day. Phase three, Monday and Tuesday become full days. Wednesday through Friday, we refer to this as a cohort schedule, or in other words, students stay together. After that phase, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday become full days. Thursday and Friday are reduced, our two hour early dismissal days, or the days reduced by two hours. And students on Thursday and Friday stay within a single group. In phase five, Monday through Thursday are full days. Friday students remain in a single cohort. And in the final phase, Friday remains a shortened day, but students' cohorts can mix on Friday. What happens in those last two hours of the day? We did this by design. So what this allows us to do is that we would test in phase one, the testing, seeing how it goes with meals during breakfast. Students are spaced six feet apart, but to eat, students remove their masks. We did not believe it was wise to introduce two meals on campus in the first phase. Students will have access to a grab and go lunch. Um, and then in phase one, it's that first full day introduces one lunch on campus. In the afternoon at Hadley Elementary School, this would provide us the opportunity when students are remote. So in the last two hours of the day, they return home and they have access to remote learning. This allows the specials teachers, art, music, physical education, to teach remotely at Hadley Elementary. There are several advantages to this. The guidance around teaching these particular courses is very, very strict. So for example, in physical education, if students are indoors in physical education, even if they are six feet apart, if they are indoors, they must have a mask on. They may only remove a mask when they are outdoors and they must be 10 feet apart. So teaching specials remotely was a sound practice, we felt. Um, at Hopkins Academy, and I'm gonna allow Ms. Camuso when she gets to her presentation to really dig deeply into this, um, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna let her do that. I'll finish speaking about what the plans share in common, all of them. Um, healthy buildings, I told you that part of the evaluation of the plan is about making sure that we understand what it means to reduce risk when we reopen a school building. So in an effort to ensure that our buildings are healthy, we have scheduled the inspection, repair, cleaning, and disinfecting of all HVAC systems. We will be increasing, we will be replacing our filters to ensure that the efficiency uh, rating, the MERV rating on our filters is higher than what it currently is. We will invest in air purifiers. We will invest in window fans. In order to uh, ensure bathroom hygiene, we have purchased toilet seats. And for places with fixed interactions, we will install barriers. You will see in the plans that we have rethought transition times, recess, breaks, and physical education, that we have rethought our procedures for dismissal, arrival, transitions, and how we schedule our itinerant staff, staff that move between buildings or multiple classrooms. 
We will be rethinking transportation. We already have. Um, and we made every effort to make lunchtime safer, hence our phased in approach. Another thing that's extremely important is this promoting a sense of shared responsibility. So our goal, as hopefully you can see in the plan, is to encourage parents to work with us to educate their children about the importance of mask wearing, hand hygiene, physical distancing, and how we break transmission chains, which is to limit movement as much as possible until to ensure and that we don't cause transmission, school transmission, or we don't exacerbate community transmission and gradually to allow for increased movement, but again, in a phased approach that allows us to carefully evaluate data before moving into another phase. The criteria we would use before moving into a subsequent phase, we reviewed this criteria with Dr. Allen. The two criteria are community transmission and school transmission. Community transmission, we would evaluate that using, and I believe Dr. Mosler from the Board of Health is also going to be here this evening. She may already be here. But community transmission is something that, uh, the way we evaluate that is by tracking percent positivity in the county. In the plan, there are several links that allow people to check for themselves. Statewide percent positivity, that's the John Hopkins University link. I believe right now it is roughly 2.4% in Massachusetts. We have asked DPH to expand the Department of Public Health to expand the table that it provides with percent positivity uh, data by city and town and to add all of the counties to that. Currently, Hadley, the percent positivity in Hadley based on a 14 day average is 0.38%. However, Dr. Allen has said you do not want to look at just a town because you want numbers at uh, at least 100,000. So Hampshire County, I believe, would give us roughly 160,000 uh, to base the analysis on. We don't want, just like statewide, uh, 5%. Once things go above 5%, that's where when you look at maps, you see states in the red. Um, states where things are not trending in the right direction. So we want that community transmission number always below 5%. Uh, there are a number of superintendents talking about coordinating our response to community transmission data. So it would be a regional approach to that. The way you track school-wide transmission is through case count. Although you don't look at case count, in other words, the number of cases in school as an absolute number, the, our, our goal, our desire, is that there are zero cases. However, that is highly unlikely. There, there will be positive cases, just as there are in the community. We will do everything in our power to reduce the likelihood of that happening, but it, if I were to say anything else, that would be dishonest. So it's not straight case count. Of if you get a case, that means you have a school transmission problem. It, when there is a positive case, school nurses, Department of Public Health, the Board of Public Health, and the Contact Tracing Collaborative monitor very closely those people who are considered close contacts of the positive case. And then what we're monitoring for is to determine whether or not spread occurs as a result of the positive case. So transmission is about spread and not simply absolute case count. Prior to exiting a phase, we would convene, we're recommending that we would convene a single agenda item special school committee meeting to look at community transmission data and school transmission data and determine one, if our mitigation strategies are effective, two, if we should enter the next phase, maintain the current phase, or if we need to go back. Um, and that is, the overarching framework of in-person. Hybrid, in our hybrid plan, many districts that you hear that are talking about hybrid plans had no choice but to develop a hybrid plan because they could not achieve their physical distancing targets 
without reducing the number of students in the school. We are able to achieve our physical distancing target of six feet with 100% in. We have had to repurpose some spaces for learning, whether it's a gymnasium or using the cafe for a class, but we are able to get 100% of students in and achieve our physical distancing target. For us, the hybrid plan needs to solve a very different problem. And I also wanna say, and I talked about this with Dr. Allen, the issue with starting with a hybrid plan and allowing for, for particularly at high schools, allowing for students to follow their traditional schedule. In doing that, the plan does not take into consideration group transmission or social transmission chains, and I cannot underscore this enough. So that if students are moving and mixing cohorts in different classes, there is a much greater possibility for exposure and spread. So a hybrid model for us is not a phase because we need to very slowly introduce cohort mixing or students mixing in, in multiple groups as you would see in a traditional middle and high school schedule. The reason we would need a hybrid plan is because it is, it could very well happen that if there were a positive case that due to the requirements for isolation, that we may find ourselves not only because of exposure or infection within schools, but even in the community, we may find ourselves in a situation where we do not have enough staff to supervise students at the desired physical distance, in which case we would need to reduce the number of students who are attending school at a given time so that we can maintain our physical distance goals and have appropriate supervision of students. Our remote learning plan is essentially, um, there's two options for that. And we have had two teachers who took the lead in rewriting expectations and clarifying expectations for remote learning. However, the remote learning plan will look different if the entire district is in remote learning or if the district is in person and there are families who choose remote learning. And the difference would be if the entire district were in remote learning, simply put, students for the most part are just following their schedule online. If the district is in person and families have chosen in-person learning, teachers will, are, will make every effort to organize all of their instruction within Google Classroom in an online platform to make it very easy for students and families who choose remote learning and for students who may have to be at home due to symptomatic, uh, due to infection or uh, because they are a close contact and they have to quarantine or isolate. So when we are in person, the teachers, and that's another benefit of having the early dismissal, is that teachers have time every single day Remote learning does not become an afterthought. Teachers have time every single day to focus on improving the quality and organization of Google Classroom. The Google Classroom is not only a space for students who are learning remotely. There are benefits to utilizing Google Classroom to every extent possible, even when students are physically present, because certainly it can reduce the amount of passing out of papers, of tests, of other things, so it can reduce kind of passing objects around. So we have created a plan that prepares us for three very likely scenarios, all of which are likely to occur at some point over the next school year. The first scenario, how do we safely and responsibly bring students back and staff back into school buildings? So that in-person plan focuses very much on mass, hand hygiene, physical distance, and, a, and group distancing. So a phased in approach to students mixing cohorts, going in and out of different groups, a phased and slow approach. The hybrid plan will help us to respond in the event that we we see that we simply uh, are 
don't have enough staff for a period of time, perhaps due to quarantining or for some other reason. And so hybrid allows us to reduce the number of students that are physically on campus. I will say again, hybrid as a phase does not make sense unless you are a district that cannot physically fit all students in your building. But if you, if you start with hybrid and you allow students to move in and out of groups, there is a, a greater potential for community spread and excuse me, school-wide spread in that model. And then our remote learning plan. That's the big picture of what these plans have done. I also want to let parents know that any family may choose remote learning. We do ask in our plan that families, when they make that decision, that if they've chosen remote learning, they would commit to that decision for an entire quarter and provide us with two weeks notice if it is their intent to rejoin us for in-person learning. And that will allow us to make sure that our learning spaces are balanced and that we maintain our physical distancing goals. Um, that's the overall look at all of the plans. And I will say again for a final time that it is critical in all of these plans, it is critical that we use data and that we follow data in all of these plans. And that is something I believe that are currently that our plan is the only plan that is tied to very specific public health metrics. And now I would like to provide the principals an opportunity to speak in more detail about their school plans. So Ms. Camuso, would you like to bring us through the Hopkins Academy school plan? Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. McKenzie and everyone for coming. I appreciate it. I hope you've had time to look through everything. I know our plans are very long. Some of the information in the Hopkins plans uh, does repeat a little bit around some of the areas, and I will talk about that at the beginning um, that you can sort of skim through. So first, I just wanted to mention some of the values that helped to inform the plans themselves. So of course, health and safety, as has been mentioned in scientific evidence, are both paramount in thinking about these plans and how we're gonna design those. Additionally, equitable access is really important in terms of opportunities and resources for all students and educational rigor and opportunity. Especially in the cohort model, you might be wondering how it is that we're going to maintain that. So we have a lot of different ideas about how that might work, uh, or even in remote learning, depending what your experience was like in the previous spring. There are some features that all of the plans have in common. Um, similarly with the overall district plan, right, in these smaller plans, you see a lot of these same things. There are procedures around physical distancing always exist. Uh, we do have two different in-person plans, one which is at three feet, it's actually at a meter, and one which is at six feet. And then other procedures around masks and mask breaks, hand washing, traffic patterns, entry and exit of the building, and then even really specific miscellaneous details um, that you guys might not always think about, but things like how do I go to the office and make an appointment to see a counselor, or what do I do if I want after school help? Or if I'm a senior and I normally get to leave for lunch, do I still get to leave for lunch? So all of those smaller items are also included in the plans as well. And those stay consistent. So in any version of these plans, uh, you know, with the exception of if you're at home, we can't control your hand washing there, then all of those stay the same. Some other things, right? So no matter what, even in the plan that's at three feet, lunch groups are always smaller. So they're always at six feet. They create more of that distance. In all of the plans, as Dr. McKenzie just said, there is access to Google Classroom. And in all of them, students are going to be taking their currently registered classes. So we're not changing any of the courses that students have signed up for. And they all have access to student services. So Grid C services, ELL services, counseling services, they have access to all of those. So in our first plan, which we call our in-person three-foot plan, I know it's a very creative title, uh, and again, three feet is the uh, DESI's minimum, but when we measured, we actually measured at a meter, which is a little bit more than that. So in this plan, our physical distancing is actually only 11% of our classes are at that minimum. 47% fall somewhere in between. Uh, I apologize that I can't be more specific. We'd have to go in and measure 
each individual classroom at the varying sizes, but they all fall somewhere in between that one meter and six feet, and 42% are at six feet or more. So even in this plan, it's not the majority of our classes by any means that are at this closer proximity. Um, and, you know, I guess it's always a work in process. We can continue to see if we can get more creative to create more space, but it's a, a pretty good starting point around that. And our small school size and our generally small class size is obviously really helpful in making that possible. The school day in this plan is from 740 until 210. So we did push in all versions of the in-person plan, the morning start time for students. Normally that last bell where they're then gonna be tardy is at 730. And all these plans is at 740. That allows for morning supervision of students as they enter the building. So normally they would go in and enter into the cafeteria and sort of wait there in a mess of children. That's obviously not acceptable. So students will be held uh, and then come into the building in one of three entryways. They will go directly to their either first period or cohort class, depending on um, the plan. But in either case, that allows for teachers to be present for supervision of those groups of students. This plan does keep the current registration and the rotating schedule. So the regular waterfall rotating schedule where students would leave their classes and go from A period to B period and so on and so forth. It would give them direct instruction from the teacher of the class that they are taking and students would mix in that plan. Again, under the health and safety standards, the same procedures around wearing masks, um, hand washing. We have a list in this specific plan of mask breaks in designated zones. The zones don't change in either plan, but which students take a break in which zone and how many are there does change between this uh, plan and the six foot one. And those are in the longer plan itself if you wanted to take a look at that. Um, similarly in this plan, breakfast does happen during second block and there is a list by grade level of when that happens during that second block and lunch would be in the classroom at six feet apart. And of course, parents have the remote option during this where students would use Google Classroom. In our next in-person plan, and again, the state only asked us, uh, the state commissioner asked us for two, uh, for one, sorry, but we have two plans. So in this one, this is at six feet, and it's a cohort model, which as Dr. McKenzie said, means that all of the students stay together in one small group. So in this plan, because we do that, they're able to stay six feet apart in that cohort, they remain with the same grade level peers. So each cohort group is based on grade level. Um, and that would limit the exposure and the transmission because they basically come into to their cohort and they stay there. And I'll in a minute go through a slide that takes you through the exact day. They may leave the classroom for services. So the services that I mentioned before, that would be the reason besides the restroom break that a student would leave the class if they needed to see the nurse, um, any services, but otherwise they stay within the cohort. That school day, as Dr. McKenzie indicated, is an early dismissal. So it's from 7.40 to 12. They would have access to an educator, not necessarily, but at times it may be, their actual teacher of a course, um, but it's a, an educator in the room. They have access to the technology, Google Classroom, and then when and if we added in that regular day, it would be able to sort of seamlessly move back into the regular transition. From 12.30 to three, which gives a little window of time to get home, students would then participate in independent remote learning. So they wouldn't necessarily have a specific Zoom time with the teacher. Um, teachers would be doing some other things at that time, but they would have access to support staff, counseling, ESPs, um, and they would also have a specific task that was laid out for them to complete independently by their teachers. So it sort of extends their day um, a little bit, but not if you count the entire time on learning, because of the other mask breaks that are within the day. So in this plan, similarly, they're gonna have two mask breaks, two mask breaks. Um, and so that, in addition to the lunch period, even though it seems like it's a longer day, adds up to the same amount of time that we would usually have in a school day. And so all of those stay the same. And this one though, breakfast would only happen, it would be ordered, uh, actually I was just talking to um, Ms. Zach about this this morning, we, we believe instead of every day, it would be ordered for the week ahead of time, and then students would pick it up in the morning on the way into school from the cafeteria. It would then bring it to that cohort class. Lunch would be bagged and dropped off, and then they would leave to go have lunch at home. Um, and then, again, same thing, parents maintain the right to uh, Google Classroom and remote access. 
I'm going to go through what the day itself looks like. I know some parents and teachers have had some questions about that. Um, and so I assume uh, that everyone else here, here might as well. So I just wanted to put together what it actually looks like for everyone. The students arrive via one of three entrances, which is based on grade level. During that time, we have people who are at each entrance and in the parking lot to supervise that arrival. Again, if a student ordered breakfast, they would pick that up. It would be at a table with their name on it. They would just pick it up and go to their cohort class. If they didn't, they would just immediately go to their cohort class instead. Um, they arrive and they stay in that cohort class until noon, again, unless they're taking one of their two mask breaks, which are supervised. So the teacher goes out with them to their designated zone to do that, a bathroom break, or to access services. In that cohort, they participate in remote learning. So essentially, it's a model where it's remote learning, but in school. So in school, they have the ability to access uh, teacher support for anything that they might need help with and school resources. Additionally, each cohort, besides being made by grade level for the students, was assigned to a primary grade level teacher. Many of you might know that in our school, we do have teachers who teach multiple grade levels. So it's not exclusive, uh, but you might have a whole grade level team, right? So if you're in the seventh grade, all of the seventh graders have Ms. Duncan, Mr. Burgess, Mr. Breland, and Ms. Silent. And so those teachers can also work together within the schedule to arrange time to sort of live stream lessons. So if Ms. Duncan wanted to demonstrate a lab for her students, she can complete that lab in front of her seventh grade students. The other teachers can all set up their projectors with Zoom, and that can be streamed to all of the seventh grade students at the same time. Um, so having them in those sort of grade level cohorts also allows for some collaboration with the teachers, which that afternoon time also allows for. So in general, students are expected to follow, you know, follow their schedule with the support of the teacher, um, whether they're at home or they're in person. But again, especially seven through 10, the majority of their blocks are all similar. They all take English seven, they all take English eight. So they can sort of share some of that time and structure and say, well, today, even though B block, you might normally be in math, we're all gonna do a, a science lesson during this time. Then at noon, students, if they've ordered lunch, will get that lunch and that order is taken in school brains in the morning by the cohort teacher. And then they go home to complete their remote learning independently. I'm gonna add one more slide about the cohort. Um, a couple of these came up with questions with the faculty, so I just wanna make sure to clarify. In this phased approach, again, that Dr. McKenzie talked about, for six weeks at minimum, right, they stay in that cohort, cohort Monday through Friday. In phase two, if we reintroduce that one day on Monday, what we are reintroducing is that very first plan that I shared with you, the in-person three-foot plan. So they would be at that one meter apart, there's 11% of classes, 47% for three to six and 42 for six or more. And they would move through their classes in the day, in a full day and have lunch. In phase three, you end up with two days and so on and so forth. So I did just wanna make sure that everybody understood that in this model, that's also um, a part of the current plan. Next, we have our hybrid plan. We have two in here. We have the traditional plan that we first came up with. So I still wanted to share that with you briefly. Um, before we decided that it, it probably wouldn't meet our desires and our needs. We do have a traditional one, which would eliminate half of the students in the building. We would use our English classes in order to divide those numbers and keep families together. Uh, our reason to do English is because every student takes English at the school, seven through 12, and a lot of the upper level English classes are all very large. So it would be a good place to start splitting students. And then we sort of figure out where that impacts them and all of the other classes. So that's actually something that would get done by hand if we decided to ever use this plan. In this one, it's a full school day from 7.40 to 2.10. Again, students stay in their current classes and they move throughout the day. Same things again under mass breaks, physical distancing, uh, lunch in the classroom in that small group at six feet, and then the same options for Google Classroom and access to Google Classroom. The other hybrid plan that we started to talk about is this idea, again, that would apply for Hadley, since we can fit all the students in the school. Again, it's more about designing at the time of need and, again, trying to keep families together where we can. And so it's something we would use, as Dr. McKenzie said, if there was some type of faculty or staff shortage. So, for example, if grades 7 and 9 were impacted in some way, then we might cohort grades 7 through 9 and use the remaining teachers to supervise all of them, uh, and then cohort 10 through 12, and then they might alternate. And that's just an example there's no specifics because, again, it would be very dependent on the need at that time. And within that, though, the protocols and the schedule that would be followed most likely would be the cohort schedule. 
I just wanted to add that note. Our last plan is our remote plan, is the 100% remote plan. I do want to point out that there is a difference between the 100% remote plan and the access that I mentioned to remote learning through Google Classroom before. So when you look at our remote plan, those expectations that are outlined are when all students are 100% remote in the district. At that point, teachers have greater opportunity and access to more face time with students. If you look in our plan, I've provided three different lesson examples, one where it's 100% face time, one where it's 29%, and one where it's 0%. When students are in school, but they're uh, remote learning either by choice or because they've had to quarantine, those students are accessing the Google Classroom and all materials will be present for them, but there is not as much face time and one-to-one -one instruction during that time. So those expectations are different for those two. Under our 100% plan, it obviously achieves physical distancing. The school day would remain 7.40 to 2.10. That's also different than the spring where we didn't have that strict school day. In this case, attendance is checked every day, the school day exists, and all of the policies around grading and attendance also exist. Students would continue to maintain their registration, they would follow, so even though they're home, right, their teachers would also follow the rotating schedule, you know, so it's an ABC day, a DEA day, and they would continue on, so on and so forth, even though they're home, and they would have access to their direct teacher instruction through Google Meet or Zoom. So again, overall, uh, we have three plans, but actually five plans all together for Hopkins. So we have two in person, one which is at three feet with mixing, one which is at six feet, which is cohorted, then we have our traditional hybrid, we have a Hadley version of a hybrid, and then we have 100% remote. Um, those are all of the plans, and I look forward to everyone's feedback during the public comment. Ms. Dowd, thank you very much, Ms. Camuso. Ms. Dowd, would you like to take people through the Hadley Elementary plans? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jennifer Dowd and I'm the principal at Hadley Elementary School. Hadley Elementary School currently has enrolled approximately 275 students, grades pre-K through six. I want to start tonight by saying thank you to the school committee and Dr. McKenzie for their encouragement, leadership, and communication while creating the HES re-entry plans. I would also like to thank my incredible staff and families for your kind words and strong feedback, which helped create and shape the draft plans presented this evening by me. I'd also like to thank Ms. Corvo, who in a last minute effort organized and put some wonderful uh, backgrounds on the slideshow that you're gonna be looking at. And again, it's just a brief um, description of our plans. And lastly, I also would like to congratulate Ms. Camuso, who has accomplished so much in just her first month of being principal at Hopkins Academy. It's been an interesting month, I'm sure. <laughs> Next slide. We too wanted to look at our values. We have our typical um, Hadley Elementary School mission statement. Um, we also always want an environment that fosters cooperation, critical thinking, creativity, integrity, and a love of learning. We've had to additionally um, add values during this challenging time and tied them and tried to keep them in the forefront of our minds while making these plans. And they include health and safety, scientific evidence, educational rigor and opportunity, social and emotional health of our students. That's an important one that our staff wanted to include and inclusion and equal access for all of our students. Our first of the three plans, we only have three plans. We're naturally cohorted because we have classroom teachers. So we found it, we only really needed the three plans. Our in-person safety and educational plan, this aligns with Hopkins Academy, except of course that we're naturally cohorted in classrooms with a homeroom teacher. As you can see, the school day has been adjusted for dismissal at one o'clock with structured specials at the end of the day. Given the restrictions that were given to us by DESI, we recognize that this was important to do because specials were almost impossible to do in person. 
And so we save them for the end of the day and there will be structured activities. And I'm working very closely and hard with our specials teachers to make a robust program for families to access, not just between one o'clock and three o'clock, but at any time during the night. We recognize that families might have a different schedule when they get home and they might look forward to doing some art, music or PE together in person, together after dinner or whatever. Um, so our school day does allow for 100% of students to be in person with measures for physical distancing at six feet apart. We didn't do the three feet apart. We did six feet apart. Um, in all the classrooms, some important factors include the measuring of classroom space to allow all students enrolled to have full access to an in-person learning. It is important to note that classroom assignments at six feet apart called for additional spaces to be used such as the gym, library, and adjacent classrooms for additional space. Final classroom assignments and class lists will depend upon enrollment. So we also have to recognize that we'll have numbers that might shift our plans for adjacent classrooms, the gym, the cafeteria. We really need to, to look at our final numbers so that we can, we can make adjustments as needed. Routines and structured transitions have been initially planned and can be found in detail in the draft document. Arrival and dismissal will be coordinated by wings, and there are currently five designated areas and doors in which students and teachers will um, be assigned to enter and exit to minimize crowding during business, busy times. I've worked with Hadley Fire Department and with Chief Spanknable around procedures, and it's ongoing and changing every day. Classroom routines will be taught to students and will also be ongoing. The next slide was provided to us by Ms. Williams. This is an example in which she has provided us. She is currently working with students on these very routines during our in-person summer school this week. So we're asking students to work on, is my mask on? Are my hands clean? Is my workspace, workspace clean? And am I six feet away from the person next to me? We are also um, ordering and working on floor and wall decals. So they'll be placed to teach distancing and walking in the hallways. April Camuso and I are working on coordinating that effort so that it aligns with both buildings for those people who travel in between. Final schedules, procedures, Class assignments will depend upon the in-person enrollment numbers, and we would anticipate some changes given families wanting the remote option. Again, during the in-person and hybrid remote option is available, parents will maintain the option to remote learn in both in-person and the hybrid models, and the students will use Google Classroom with full access to the teachers through email. The next slide highlights the hybrid plan. The hybrid plan, I'm currently surveying staff. We're looking at the parent surveys to drive our next steps in planning for the, for the hybrid model. Um, that survey was given to staff this week. They were gonna complete it. And then I've also asked if staff would be willing to meet with me as a group to problem solve around our hybrid model. I've already had a, a lot of um, interest in joining me over the summer, which I appreciate because I know people's time is, is very valuable, but it speaks to the commitment of my staff to make sure that these plans um, have all stakeholders' opinions accounted for. And that means parents and also staff members. So when considering the hybrid plan, all the safety and health measures remain the same. There is just a reduction of 50% of students in the physical building. Again, I've surveyed my st staff and I'm looking forward to meeting with them. We're looking at parent survey data to select a model and decide the cohort composition. Some of the proposed models include one week on, one week off, split days of the week between group A and B, early dismissal, would continue to happen. Administration would also make adjustments according to, to staff and student data. In all decisions, 
we look at available staff and the number of students attending in person at all times the hybrid when the hybrid is required i've listed the factors that will drive cohort selection in the hybrid model and they include family units we recognize that there are family units spread between hopkins and also hes we want to take into account that older siblings might be watching younger siblings and we want to make this an easy process or as easy as possible for families for child care we recognize that that too is an issue uh, students with disabilities ell students high risk students and pre-k we also are anticipating having a pre-K and kindergarten meeting to look at procedures and, and protocols for what our hybrid and in-person plans would look like. <clears throat> the next slide would be our remote plan. So this would account for students that are home 100% of the day. The school day would be 825 to 250. Uh, students would access Google Classroom. Daily schedule will include access to classroom teacher and specialists. Um, in the cohort model at HA, it's a little different because you're going to have lots of, um, lots of cohorts in the hybrid plan. But in our, in our remote plan, we will have specific schedules that will fit our 825 to 250 schedule, teaching schedule. Students and teacher expectations will be shared with families right at the start of the school year. There are specific, specific details outlining teacher and student remote learning expectations. We will not adopt the credit, no credit system of grading like we did during the spring. Rather, we will have a clear grading policies that align with our traditional standards-based report card. So that is the brief outline of the proposed plans. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak tonight. And I look forward to the public comment to answer specific questions around our plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Dowd and Ms. Camuso. I really appreciate that. As Ms. Dowd had said, if we were to be in a, if we were in a condition that required us to be in a hybrid plan, a primary consideration would be to ensure that families are together. So you wouldn't have students on different plans. You wouldn't have children in one household on different plans or with different schedules. Another thing that's important to remember is that in adopting a phased in approach that looks at transmission data. So in that first assuming, assuming that the public health data in early September, assuming that that data indicate, that those data indicate that we can enter school buildings. If, when that is the case, students come into school buildings, and I told you that before exiting a phase, we would look at two things, community transmission data and school transmission data. And a staff member asked last week a very good question. Well, what happens if the school transmission data looks different at Hopkins Academy and Hadley Elementary School? Then what happens? One school's in one phase, another school's in another phase. No, the school with the, the, the school that we, we go to the safest. Um, so if a school has a transmission problem and can't exit a phase, that school dictates what the district does. So the schools move together in phases. So community transmission data would be the same countywide. When we look at community transmission, we're looking at percent positivity rates in the county. School transmission data could be different if we had anything that indicated school transmission, but we would move together from one phase to another both Hadley Elementary and Hopkins Academy. I know that we also, as part of our development of these plans, um, looked at feedback from um, families and from our faculty and staff. And actually, before we get to the feedback data, on the remote plan, I just didn't know 
if Mr. Burns or Ms. Jalinas wanted to make any comments about the remote plans. You certainly don't have to, but did you want to? No, I see a thumbs down. They're good. Okay. Certainly if the school committee has additional questions about that, we can respond at that time. So as I said, we did look at feedback and survey data. And so um, we do have data from our teachers, our paraprofessionals, and Mr. Burns, did you want to speak to that, the original uh, survey that you had taken of members of the Hadley Education Association? I don't think I need to. I think it speaks for itself. If the members have any specific questions, I'm happy okay. to answer them. Perfect. Thank you. We also had data from a family survey. And Paul Pfeiffer, would you like to speak to that? Sure, Annie. It's a, um, Corey, do we have that? Can we pull that up? So I, uh, Annie just asked me to, to look through. There was 300 some odd responses and I just did some simple analysis on them. Just try to help it make it a little bit more understandable. So most folks had read the draft reopening plan. And then I broke out the, the, you know, the key questions. If you do have a child attending school, are you, what are your plans right now? What do you think your plans will be uh, for the fall? And we had three different categories, four different categories. Yes, I'll send my, my son, my children, my child in person. I'm not sure, but I'm leaning towards in person. I'm not sure, but I'm leaning towards remote or remote only. And what we see here is that uh, if you look, I broke it down by school, those parents that have uh, both um, children in both schools and then Hopkins only. Across those total, you had 42% saying they would uh, send their, their lean, they're saying right now they'd send their child or children uh, to be in person. And then you had 27% saying leaning towards in person, 16% leaning towards remote, 15% leaning towards uh, or, or remote. So all told about 69% leaning or decided to send their child, children in person. And then you get about 31% leaning or decided to send their, uh, keep their child for remote. Some of the challenges that we saw, if you can scroll up a little bit, Corey, thanks. Um, you had two big concerns about challenges in household. Uh, and this would be, you know, concerns related to COVID, concerns related to school, to children either staying home or going to school. You had childcare was a concern, and then you had uh, existing medical medical conditions as a concern. We had a significant number of no responses, though I'll note there. Uh, we had some comments about hybrid preference if we were to do a hybrid model, and I think uh, you know this. We talked a bit about this already. There's some folks who would decide to keep their child at home with a hybrid model. Um, others preferred uh, every other week for or morning. Uh, some folks said did not matter or a couple days a week. So the, the significant, most significant response there is if we do a hybrid model, do it from a, as a couple days a week. Um, then there was a question about whether your child is accustomed to wearing a mask. And the vast majority, uh, kudos to folks out in the community, the vast majority said their child, 77% is very accustomed, is accustomed to wearing a mask. And then finally, uh, there was a question about buses. And so we had 64 responders say, yes, obviously these are folks who, it, it wasn't quite clear if these were just the folks who were, said they would send their child. Um, clearly we had 270 respond, responders, so it's not quite clear um, what subsection of those folks say they wouldn't send their child or leaning to, to just remotely. But you had 140 people saying they'd find an alternate arrangement to a bus. And then 24% uh, saying they take the bus and then a full quarter of the people saying they're not sure. And then there was a question pertaining just to kindergartners and first graders. Are they comfortable that their kindergartner or first grader would wear a mask or with their child wearing a mask? Uh, and the majority said yes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, Paul for the Thanks. presentation and for the analysis. I really appreciate it. In these plans, we want to certainly make sure that the school committee has an opportunity to ask questions. The plan, as many of you know, can be found on our district website. It's still considered a draft. 
until such time as we've integrated all of the feedback that we need to make made any recommended changes and it's approved, which does not happen this evening. I am sure that uh, this sounds in many ways just quite confusing and it doesn't help that there's a conversation that appears to be happening in the Commonwealth in which people really think that what we're doing right now is having a debate about what we're going to, what's going to happen in six weeks. That's not what we're doing, nor what we've been charged with. I will say again, we've been asked to create plans that allow us to respond to the three very likely scenarios that could occur next year. And we've been asked to create plans that demonstrate that we have a solid understanding of what it means to reduce risk when you open schools, which is why we have tied, we have developed a plan that focuses on phases, that uses public health metrics to make decisions, and that does not solely focus on physical distancing, but also takes into consideration group distancing, which doesn't sound like a great time, perhaps, if you're a Hopkins Academy student in the first six weeks of school, but we wouldn't recommend it if we didn't feel so strongly that it will help to reduce risk. So I will say again, because I've received emails about this, gosh, well, I see these other districts are starting in hybrid plans and why don't we just do that? I'm saying for us, group distancing is important. A hybrid plan that allows for mixing of cohorts does not place adequate emphasis on the importance of group distancing. It's why when the state was in lockdown, they said, stay home, don't mix. So those are our plans, um, and we certainly welcome questions from the school committee, and obviously this is the hardest part. Um, these plans require us to be flexible and to be very flexible. Um, I, I cannot dictate what a virus is going to do six weeks from now, two months from now, or three months from now depending on what the data indicate, that will determine what decision we make around how we deliver education. I know that folks are often saying, let's decide today what's going to happen September 14th. I personally would say, how can we know that? How can we know that? Things could change drastically, I hope they don't in terms of negative trends around statewide percent positivity or community transmission in Hampshire County, or people could continue to adhere to the most important practices to slow virus transmission, which is wearing a mask, physical distancing, and thinking very carefully about even personally, when you cohort mix, how many groups do you mix with? When people do these things, then we slow transmission rates. We don't know what will happen over the next month, but we want to be prepared for all possibilities. And now if the school committee has questions for anyone, we would be happy to answer those. Thanks, Annie. Um, and thank you very much both to um, April and Jen for presenting the detail on the plans um, and Paul for discussing the survey uh, feedback. So across the committee and, and including um, Jack in this conversation as well, um, I just, I'd like to open by um, commending everyone for the transparency. Um, we have seen these plans literally develop uh, online as they've, as they've been worked on. So um, I, I will just note that it may seem like we have a lot of links and a lot of pieces of information and a lot of places to go. Um, we'll get that you know, compiled in a more digestible and maybe uh, clearer, you know, format. But for now, what we have is a lot of information that was developed um, in a very transparent way. So I just want to commend folks for that. Um, let me just open it up to the rest of the school committee. What uh, questions would you like to pose um, in this meeting for right now? Hey, Heather, if I could ask a question, this is Paul. So yeah, first off, thank you, April, uh, uh, Jennifer, and um, Annie, uh, Mr. Burns. I think you all did a, a fabulous job. And actually, maybe if I could direct my comment, Jason, to you. The part that's in the packet about the um, 
HEA and their responses. Help me understand how some of that compares to some of the, the iterations and, and the options we had presented by um, Jen and, and April. It seems like there's not a full crosswalk against what was asked of the HEA folks and what's in the options presented to us. Is that correct? Um, sorry, can you rephrase that? I'm not sure what you're asking. So in the, the, the packet that we have, it says HEA thoughts on reopening of Hadley Public Schools. And it talks about different, uh, obviously it's based on a survey and it talks about uh, folks' comfort related to different uh, options. Right. One is uh, students returning to the building and desks three feet apart for certain grades and then other grades six feet apart. And then it talks about multiple hybrid models. So in particular, I was concerned about those hybrid models, but I don't necessarily see that um, equivalent because those are hybrid models of uh, rotating. And I guess what I'm keying in on is this option that say we talked about with cohorting where the say in Hopkins where the students are six feet apart, the first phase really is that's been articulated in that cohort. Is there, was that asked of the HEA folks, their opinion of that uh, option? Um, it was. Um, one of our primary concerns um, was about distancing. Um, the staff across the board wanted to see six feet or as close to six feet as possible. And the cohort plan um, is the one besides, of course, fully remote, but the cohort plan is the one that achieved that. Um, so myself and uh, Ms. Gelinas, who is the other teacher who helped with that in the school, school nurses, all felt comfortable that the cohort plan achieved our goal of that. Okay. But that was there a, is there a pie chart that represents how the HA feels on that model? There is not. We have not asked that at this point. Okay. Thank you. So I'm just trying to understand how that cohort uh, option relates to 54% of the HEA folks saying they prefer remote learning. Uh, is there a way for me to understand how those two questions relate? Uh, not at the moment, no. Okay. Can I tack on to that question, Paul, too, for Jason? Um, I'm just curious, too. So uh, when we looked through the models for the in-person, the elementary schools at the six foot distancing, it's the high school where it really becomes a problem. Do we have information um, that separates the two schools to know if there is a concern with teachers in the elementary school um, with in-person, if the, the big concern that kind of came around was the six foot distancing? Um, I think I, I do have the numbers separated out, not that I can pull up right this second. Uh, I can find those numbers, forward them to you. That'd be great. I have a quick question for you, Jason, and that is, um, what is the date of that survey? It was June 28th, so it's about a month old. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question that might, that is, um, I guess directed at, at more of a specific thing that I personally have been thinking about. Um, I know that the goal of all of the plans, but this would be for the in-person one with cohorts specifically, is to, um, you know, keep the same sort of classes available, the same opportunities available for us as we would normally have um, in the year. Uh, obviously, there's limits on that. But um, my something I've been thinking a lot about is the band program, because um, that is something that it's such a... There's, I, in my mind, I can't think of any way that that's really, that that could be maintained in the way it currently was or the way it has been. Um, so I was wondering if there had been any idea of what was happening with that, because I also know the band room is supposed to be repurposed as classroom space. Um, so if there's any idea about that, that's something I was interested in. I can answer that for now. So that's still a work in progress. Guidance for those courses just came out in the last, week, I believe, right, Dr. McKenzie? And so those teachers are working on that. There is guidance to allow band and chorus to happen under certain conditions. Uh, and in the, the three-foot model, um, I don't believe there's, there's so many docu documents, as was mentioned in length, I don't believe the full public has all of the room assignments. But for example, band and chorus have been reassigned to the cafeteria where there's more space. 
or outdoor space, right? So there are places to create more space for those courses and there is guidance for them to follow to allow them to exist. And in the earlier remote portions, I know um, Mr. Fazio has been doing a lot of research in terms of, of music theory and individuals doing some recordings and putting that together as well. So that those pieces are still a work in progress. Um, those and so similarly, for anyone who's curious, and, and these parts aren't in the plan specifically, but other extracurriculars are also in progress. So teachers are working on developing plans that also meet the standards that we are expecting, and they're putting those forth to see which extracurriculars might be able to be offered during the school year, whether we are remote or in person. Um, and then I'm also working on putting together a student advisory board for other general activities that usually happen during the year as well, which would be composed of student leadership. So those pieces, we don't have definitive answers yet, yet for those, but they're all a work in progress. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, it's just, that was one question I was getting from a lot of different people I was talking to, a lot of students was that in particular. Um, so so I basically, as the plans continue to develop, we'll see some more definitive stuff on that. Thank you. Kind of related to that, April and Jen, I, I know there is a discussion about tents being available, how do you see those being used? So I can go first. Yes, we have, um, we're lucky at HES where we have lots of outdoor space. We have the two fields behind us and lots of um, other areas. So we have asked that three tents be purchased for outside. Now, obviously this is New England and um, you know, the weather is <laughs> what it is. It can change on a dime, we all know that. So we want to be mindful. Um, we're really going to have to work day to day to make sure that kids have as much access to outside fresh air as possible. I have had a wonderful conversation with classroom teachers who are really excited about being able to spend as much time outside as possible. And obviously we'll have time to spend on scheduling what each teacher will be doing per day with students outside. Um, but we really appreciate the fact that these tents have been purchased for us so that we can utilize them. We also have the outdoor pavilion, we have the playscape, um, and again, we have the outdoor fields. So we're anticipating to use them for mass breaks, for outdoor learning space. Anytime that we can be outside, we will be. April? Thanks. So I think for us, we also are looking at three tents. Those three would be primarily classroom spaces, um, one which would actually be more for primarily science classrooms and then uh, another two located where the old gym was, for those of you who know that on that large grass area, um, would be another two classrooms out there that teachers could sign up for and utilize that space. And then besides that, in, uh, in the plans you can see, we have the other zones which have been designated for mass breaks, but they do not have tents. So we would have to ask students to bring their appropriate <laughs> weather attire pieces since this, since this is New England in order to use some of those unless one of the tented spaces was not being um, used at the time. So that's the current thinking. Anyway, we have a little bit limited space. What's hard too is that with, with Route 9 there, there are some safety concerns, there are some noise concerns, so there's some practical things around being able to have a lot of classrooms in certain areas. And then of course we have the field work being done as well. So we're just trying to be thoughtful about how to use the space that we have. Thank you. Along those lines, um, I just had a question about given the tents and encouraging, you know, where we can being outside fresh air. Can um, someone speak to the work and the research that's being done around air filtration and when you're inside the building, the air systems? Oh, would you like to speak to that or I'm happy to either way? Well, we can both. Uh, yeah, so Annie and I have been working through, uh, through this with help of uh, experts outside, and I know there's a, uh, there's a tour that's going to be that's set up with the HVAC experts to walk through. Is that correct, Annie? And, uh, you know, as, as you know, Heather, we have, at least in Hopkins, uh, an antiquated system, right, that we had tried to get um, replaced through um, recently. Uh, so we walked through with some folks just the other day, and as Annie said, we would upgrade the systems to, um, to maybe the better way to say it is we clean the systems. There's some fans that really are in dire need of cleaning, 
And why that's important is these Univet systems pull in the outside air. And so what you want at least is an exchange of at least 20% outside air into that system. And that's the main mechanism, right? You'll see some of the other classrooms have the mini splits. Um, those don't really exchange air with the outside. They just heat and cool uh, fluid that gets pumped in and they recirculate inside air. So we re really want to make sure that Univent systems are fully functional. And as Annie said, we'll make sure they have the right filter. That, though there's a, a limit by this MERV rating, this maximum efficiency rating that you have. The higher up you go, the harder it is to pull air through it. You can just think that the weave gets tighter and tighter. So there's a balance between having the appropriate airflow, which is key to make sure you have that 20% of at least 20% outside air mixed in. So we'll clean the systems. We'll have the system up on the roof. So what you have is not only just the air getting pulled in, you'll have a, you'll see in Hopkins, you'll have a, a vent uh, grate on the inside and an opposite wall where there's a, a fan on the roof that pulls, sucks the air up. And so that creates the flow. And so um, we'll make sure those are open and some of them are actually blocked now. So we'll make sure there's, there's access. So the systems will be renovated, the filters will be upgraded. Uh, and then, as Annie said, you'll we'll have window fans, right? Ideally, what you, you know, when you can, when weather allows, and maybe we all get more accustomed to wearing coats uh, inside, but they, we'll have a window unit, a fan, so that we can pull in outside air. Um, and we're also talking about uh, air purifiers for each room. The issue there are two things. One is we have some very large rooms. And when you think of, you know, when you look at how an air purifier works, it's not just a uh, length times width, but it's cubic dimension, so it's height, and we have very high ceilings, say in Hopkins and, and HES. So we'd put an air purifier or two or three, depending on room size, we'd calculate this out, that would be filtering the air, and you also have to pay attention to noise there. So you factor that we've all started to look at that, price that out, to have a window unit, a fan for each room, have the HVAC cleaned, have the on the roof cleaned, uh, and have uh, the appropriate amount of air purifiers so that, that you have at least two uh, air exchanges per hour is what uh, the recent information that I can read. There's not a great uh, database of information out there, but that's the best information. So if you shoot for two air exchanges per hour uh, with HEPA filters, so you're capturing 99.97% of the air particles and they get down to the micron uh, level that'll capture the droplets that'll carry the virus. And then as Annie mentioned, there's other hot spots, right, that they'll talk about. They'll talk about bathrooms. So when you flush, things can get aerosolized. So we'll have seats. Now, of course, the issue there will be a uh, use, right? I live with two boys. <laughs> Toilet seats aren't always used as they should be, right? So we'll have to figure out how to make that part of that system, right, of not only wearing your mask, but uh, proper bathroom technique as well. We'll limit access. I think in the plans, people have to sign in and out to go to the bathroom. So you, you minimize it that way. And of course, these air purifiers and the HVAC systems where they would run more diurnally, right, during the day, uh, now we'd make sure they're running full time, right? So you'd have something processing at night uh, and in the mornings before uh, the kids get there and the staff get there. Did I miss anything, Annie? No, I think that you covered, I think you covered everything that we are currently working on. And also so people know in the section of the plan, which as Heather said, uh, we will be, now that we've drafted it, the goal is um, once we have feedback and recommendations to get it as user-friendly as possible, but we have linked in a checklist that families can, can monitor which of these things are completed and when they are complete. So you will see on there, toilet seat covers ordered. Um, when the filters, when the changeover has happened and what the MERV rating is on the filters for unit ventilators. So that is all publicly published and will link within the plan and families can monitor as it occurs. Thank you very much, both of you. I have uh, just like a, maybe a broader question. I know obviously if, if we were to go to an in-person model, if we had to go remote, I think that plan is pretty straightforward. But is there has there been any conversation about a transition from remote to in person? If if as a community we move in the right direction in terms of health and safety wise. So you're asking if we were in remote. So I'm just going to come up with a hypothetical. Let's say that community transmission data over the course of the next four weeks uh, indicated that 
any sort of in-person learning would, would not make sense at that time. And we were in remote learning. And so then when we transitioned out of remote learning into in-person, what does that look like? So again, at that point, you would most likely, I mean, this isn't the decision that everybody's making, but just in a completely logical system, you would have decided to be in remote learning because you've evaluated specific community health metrics that have made you decide that that's what you should do. And so then they start trending in a better direction and you determine that we can bring students into a building and reduce that risk. You start with phase one. You start with phase one, again, that in-person phase one, because you need to, we would need to, I would argue, we would need to determine the extent to which our mitigation strategies have the desired effect, which is to slow any sort of transmission. And so in the initial phase, any time that you're moving back into a phase, you wanna to go to that phase where you have physical distancing and group distancing, as well as all your other mitigation strategies. So does that answer your question? That's how that transition would logically work. I have three random uh, uh, disconnect uh, questions that are not related to one another. I'll start with you, Annie. Say it, the science on this is still evolving, right? Mm -hmm. This is a completely mm -hmm. um, emerging, phenomenon we learn as we go as a society. Mm -hmm. um, and we have this assumption that two cycles is what we need to, mm -hmm. um, to know whether or not we're mm -hmm. safe as a community to proceed into the next phase. Um, say we realize that actually two cycles doesn't cut it. Um, what is the mechanism by which our committee will meet and gather and adjust that? Um, how, how often are we revisiting this plan and making modifications based on the data? So assuming that um, the school committee will discuss the data at, always at its regularly scheduled meetings, so it would be on any, any agenda. But specifically, if things were just progressing along, and a phase is estimated to be no less than six weeks. Four weeks in, you have a special meeting of the school committee, board of health, school committee, um, and open to the public to look at the data and ask the question, do we move into the next phase? Do we extend the current phase? Is there something troubling us right now about anything in the data that might indicate that our mitigation strategies are not having the desired effect? If at any point in time something drastic happened within the state, I, I'm, I keep saying this, it's not as though the governor calls me and tells me what he would do, but I could assume, judging from what happened in the spring, if the state started rocketing above 5%, we're going to see what we saw on March 17th, which is a statewide closure of of schools and schools being moved remotely. If we saw something that troubled us, the school committee at any time can call an emergency meeting and you don't even need the 48 hour posting notice for an actual emergency meeting. It's still a public meeting, but if it constitutes, if it meets a threshold for emergency, you could, you could call it a true emergency meeting. Otherwise we would give 48 hours in post. So at any time the school committee, committee could convene to say, we need to take a drastically different course of action. Okay, that's really good to know um, that we would not have to delay, that we could take action right away. Um, you spoke about remote and, and um, I, I, I wanna thank you and the whole team for spending as many hours as you have for going mm -hmm. spring, summer, all your breaks. Um, and I wanna thank you also for spending about an hour and a half with me individually last Saturday, on your Saturday, going through some of these details. Um, and one thing I said to you, uh, and, and, you know, we've been uh, go, you know, continuing to talk about this, is um, this is not going away. Who knows mm -hmm. when it'll end? Um, mm -hmm. And remote is a very likely situation for mm -hmm. a large percentage of our population. Um, and uh, and it's, a, it's something that our teachers will have to factor in, in some way, shape, or form in light of students needing to quarantine or uh, 
or the state shutting down because you know um, some other part of the state is out of control in their numbers. Um, it's seven o'clock. We have some valuable time here. You know, in the spring, we had to make a shotgun decision to go online, and I commend the team on being fast and decisive and jumping in and being very um, entrepreneurial in delivery. Um, I'm very um, cognizant, though, that we may be in a situation where remote is um, is a large part of what we do. Mm -hmm. And um, the community has an impression, and I understand why, that um, remote instruction is substandard to um, in-person education. I happen to think that there's great power in uh, remote instruction. I have mm -hmm. been teaching online for the last eight years uh, globally, and I know that we're just scratching the surface in what we can do as a, as a community. Um, so I guess I'm, my question relates back to what are we doing to get our, um, our, our faculty prepared for the best practices in online um, pedagogy and good teaching practice um, so that it, it, in the inevitable um, conclusion of remote learning that we are providing the best possible instruction that we can. Okay, so I think some of the ways that we are addressing that is um, namely one of the benefits of, oh, let me start with the calendar. And for this date will be added to the draft plan. The Commissioner of Education and the Mass Teachers Association have reached an agreement that school for students will, the teachers will be provided 10 days at the start of the school year in order to prepare. And part of that preparation isn't just about going through protocols and procedures, but to allow time for teachers. As you know, our teachers will, as I said, Google Classroom will be the space even for their in-person learning where they organize a lot of their instruction. So there will be time at the beginning of the year. The resources that we have in district, we do have two tech coaches who are teachers, one in each building. We also have an instructional technology specialist. Uh, those folks and many of our teachers who are just uh, naturally interested in this and skilled at it have helped their colleagues, but we do have those specific resources in the district. I also know, Humera, that in addition to technology integration, you're talking about what does high quality and what instruction look like in an online environment because it looks very different than in-person instruction. Michael Morris, who's the superintendent of Amherst Public Schools, reached out to me last week. He and I are enrolled in an online teaching and learning design boot camp. We are talking about if that experience uh, is something that we feel as though um, the the organization and the resources and the support would benefit our instructors. We're looking to potentially partner the two communities and see how we can provide support and resources um, that would help faculty to develop these this teaching practice that um, is conducive to high quality remote instruction. And you are right, and I'm glad you've said um, this kind of ongoing emphasis on let's pick a plan and that's our plan. We will need all three of these over the course of the next year. We will. And, and just to um, reinforce what you're saying, it, it, it doesn't just come down to technology. It comes down to actual human connection and practices that allow for educators to really connect with students and create a community of, of students online. And there's, there's a lot we can do. And, uh, it's, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning of our learning journey. Uh, we have many veteran educators who are so um, uh, smart and creative in how they approach their teaching. And if we can find the right resources and learning opportunities for them, this August is really key. And we have an ability as a community to really demonstrate uh, amazing uh, teaching and learning using online mediums if we're really um, 
uh, keenly aware of and focused on that. And I'm happy to be a resource to any educator um, drawing upon whatever resources I can bring from the Stanford K-12 to K lab to uh, the work that my colleagues are doing um, across the Eastern Seaboard. I, I just think that we, can, we are in a unique position um, and it just, it, the, to the extent that we really lean in to our, those learning opportunities, we can um, be as safe as we want to be. We can be as safe and capable as we can be. But without that training, we have very little leverage to say, we can do this just as well online. So um, I, would, I would love to um, help in that regard. I would, um, I would like to thank you for asking that question because that was something that I had also been thinking about but wasn't quite sure how to phrase because I know in my personal experience and the experience of a lot of other people um, who I talked to throughout the spring and more recently to get their opinions on it, um, the quality of instruction as we moved into lockdown and obviously this is also still accounting for the fact that there was no real um, like, you know, this wasn't something that everyone was planning on doing. Um, the quality was pretty uniformly uh, lower than what we would have expected if we were in school. And again, that's what would also sort of be expected at that point, given the limitations. Um, but, but, you know, in situations where we would have to do remote or hybrid learning, it would be be great as a student to feel like um, we had made some changes so that there was more, um, there was just more, I guess, thought put into our online learning and um, sort of the way we were being given assignments and the way we we're taught things. Because I, I honestly feel like I didn't retain much of anything that I learned after March. Um, and it's going to be even more important that we make sure that students are retaining their information and learning things well and holding on to them. Um, in a future where remote learning, like you said, is going to be more common. And it's totally understandable, right, Jack? Like we were as a society uh, in paralysis of like, what the he heck is happening here? Um, you know, from companies not able to decide what actions they were going to take to, to nonprofits, you know, we can think of all of our uh, uh, diff the different facets of our life, uh, our educators did the best job they could possibly do. So, and it, and compared to other districts around the state, it was incredible. We had a plan. We had laptops to deploy. We had people donating to for for bandwidth. All that was in place. But now it's like time to take it up a notch. And exactly. And we have like a month, a good solid month plus some to, uh, to, to really like step up our game and be in a position where we can say, no problem, we can go remote and we can provide exceptional quality education mm -hmm. and we're not afraid to do that. That would be the best position we could be in um, to, you know, to, get, to get us ready for the fall. I'd like to add in just as a comment to, in regards to this, um, not just in the event that we are to go to, you know, at some point in time, I agree that at some point in time, we are going to be in all these different um, plans, but really from the get go to ensure that parents, for whatever reasons they may have to keep their child remote, that's their own personal decision to make, that we have a plan in place so that they don't feel as though their quality of education to their child or learning instruction is less and that they are um, deprived in any way for making the decision to be a remote student. So I think it's great to think about it if we are to go, but I think we need to go from the get-go. And I, I know that that that's a really challenging thing to look at and it and it seems a little bit lacking in the plan, but I know that that's because that coordination is so challenging. Um, but I think I, you know, as much as we could expand on that, or at least have a general idea of what we're starting to think that looks like to give parents who are deciding to keep their children home in the fall a little bit more comfort and ease that they feel their child is going to get an adequate education if they choose to stay home versus going to school. And I have one question that's kind of sort of related, maybe a little not. If we go um, in with, we approve these three different plans and we start in whatever phase we start in, what if throughout the year we, rather than say, well, we need to move to this plan or backtrack, what if we find that we need to just change one of our options? Like, let's say the in-person option doesn't work as is. Do we have the ability to just change a plan mid-year? Yes, 
the school committee has um, uh, the school committee absolutely has that uh, that authority. That's the short answer. The school committee has that authority. And I know the school committee knows this. I'm going to say it for the public. This is a community that um, has, that respects its educators, that treats its educators um, well. And uh, the educators in this community deserve every bit of that respect and that treatment because of, how they work and what they deliver. So I know that also when we're talking about that, we would we would have we would communicate with the educators, with the people on the ground. So I know you're not suggesting this, Tara, but I just want to make this clear that the school committee does have complete authority over plans, but we would always do this in partnership with uh, educators and families. Um, but yes, you can you can say this part isn't working, we need to do this differently. Things could drastically, we could be optimistic, things could drastically change to the positive on the public health front. Right. And that would necessitate massive changes as well. Mara, did you have a third question? Wow, you are very good, Heather, for remembering that. It's, um, it's just a little detail. But I think it's interesting. There's always something in the details, right? Paul, there was um, something in the survey that you shared. Um, and I think actually, Corey, you were sharing it. Um, and well, I'll just say what it is. But um, I thought it was interesting that there was a spike in the response on, uh, pa from parents as it related to if you had a child at Hopkins Academy and Hadley Elementary School, that you were more likely to keep them home, that, that you would more, you're more likely to have them be remote learners than if you had only a Hopkins Academy student or an only, only a Hopkins uh, elementary, sorry, a Hadley Elementary School student. Now, I can understand the Hadley Elementary School part. If you have a little kid, <laughs> it's a lot harder to work from home and manage your child's education. Um, any, any, did you notice that? that number increase and where did you have any observations around like why that might be? Uh, so I, I think there's some, there could be some <coughs> uh, analysis to look at not just of kids across the schools, but also the size of the, the, the number of students you have in school and whether that means you're more inclined for the remote or more inclined to send your kid to school. I thought about trying to do that. I wasn't sure what we'd do with that information, and it wasn't as robust enough anyway to, to discern it out. But well, I just wondered whether it meant, you know, because I, my instincts would be that if you had a Hopkins Academy student, you would be uh, more inclined to not take the chance and have them be a, a remote learner. Um, but I wonder if it's because of the way it's currently structured, um, where your uh, where it was structured previously, where you didn't need to be on a uh, on a schedule, and you um, didn't have to meet in a Zoom class with your educators and your students, taking live instruction or reporting back on a project, or you know being a part of a community, versus just the check-ins part of it. I, I wondered if that was was why. Yeah. I thought of that. I thought of size of family. I thought of the school they're in. I thought of um, that challenge associated with uh, childcare and whether that was uh, pushing people towards sending their kids to school and whether they really felt comfortable doing so, but or they felt like they had no option. Could I make an observation in the sp in the families that I speak with, especially our youngest, you know, our youngest students, the parents of our youngest students. Remote learning, while we did the best that we possibly could, the lessons that we teach our youngest children are around socialization, playing with one another. Um, the lessons that you learn in person really can't happen in a remote in learning environment. And so I do think that there was a lot of frustration with our families of the youngest kids that felt like ro remote learning was not meeting their needs. Um, can we do things better? Can we plan better? Absolutely. Um, but I can't speak to the importance of having kids in a space together. Obviously, we want it to be healthy. We want everybody to be in a space where we know we're going to be successful. Um, but the frustration from the families that I've heard from um, was that, you know, their four, five, six-year-olds we're really struggling with remote learning um, 
and teachers were trying to give activities to families and keep them engaged, but really it doesn't come close to the in-person uh, learning opportunities that, that children get from each other and from their teachers in, in, a, in a space. Thank you, Jen. And I get that. Um, and I know that we, I know we can do better as well. Uh, it, the, the little, the nuance that I was citing was, was more about the, the families that had Hopkins and Hadley Elementary School kids, that they would be more likely to keep their kid, their children home. Um, and that is even, was even greater than if they were just, uh, had kids that were just Hopkins Academy students. And so it was less about the Hadley Elementary School and more about the Hopkins Academy parents of the parents who have Hopkins Academy kids only, that they were choosing to keep, to send their kids back to school at greater numbers than those who had both. And that, that I just found super curious um, and it might be worthy to dig into at a later time. I had a question kind of shifting directions a little bit. Um, obviously transportation, you know, we have many families that rely upon public transportation, school buses to get their kids to school. Um, could somebody just speak to, and I saw the results of the survey where, um, as predicted, you know, fewer people are going to um, utilize the bus, but we do have families that are going to plan on using the buses. Uh, the plans talk about uh, screening, <clears throat> excuse me, screening procedures. They also talk about an adult that needs to be at the school bus stop with their child. Um, and it appears that would be a child of any age. Um, and so I would like to um, just have somebody address a little bit more information on what those screening procedures are um, and how that relates to, you know, the need to have an adult there uh, for, for drop off. Okay, gladly. So right now the survey indicated that just roughly, I think it was about 66 families that said uh, definite, if you break it out by school, because our buses currently run on two tiers, meaning your buses deploy to take your high school, middle high school students in, your buses deploy a second time to take your elementary school students in. Um, so the families who indicated my child will ride the bus Again, it was roughly, I want to say, 66 or 60 in the, just over the mid-60s. We have available the new, uh, the guidelines for the buses. Um, the guidelines for the buses, which is why, to the extent possible, we do encourage families, if they can, to transport their students, because the bus does create a different, a mixed cohort. So the bus creates a new cohort. Um, on the buses, we have the capacity right now with our own fleet, and we also uh, work with Five Star to meet the guidelines and transport 122 students. So we certainly are in a place to be able to transport people who have indicated that their children would ride the bus. Children are required to have masks on at all times and the driver, and we would be looking to have a monitor on buses. We have asked the screening means that if it appears as a child is getting on a bus, if they appear to be visibly unwell, um, the bus driver can say, um, I I'm sorry, you, you really don't appear well, which is why we want parents there and ask them that the parent communicate with the school nurse and our school nurses review these protocols, that the, par that the parent then communicate with the school nurse before attempting to transport their child to school. So that is, um, that's what's meant by that. And that's why we ask um, that parents are with their child uh, when their child boards the bus. Thanks, Annie. Was the intent to have as part of that screening um, temperature checks at all for children? DPH, DPH is not recommending temperature checks at this time. They've been um, consistent with that, that temperature checks is a screening procedure at schools. It doesn't mean that our nurses would not use temperature checks if a child went to the nurse, but just as a matter of course, like ongoing screening, DPH is not recommended at this time. That um, temperature is can be associated with uh, false positives and false negatives, and um, certainly temperature can be affected by outside air temperature as well as by um, if a child has consumed any sort of fever-reducing medication immediately before um, getting coming to school. Thank you. 
I had one other question about um, food services, and I see, um, I believe Diane Zach's on the line too, so maybe she may be the best qualified to answer this. Uh, in reading through the plans um, around breakfast, and I'm sorry, I don't know the the quantity of students that, um, or the percentage of students that do um, utilize the breakfast service. The, the thing that made me take pause in uh, when we got to phase two and beyond was the breakfast schedule. And with some of the students um, not receiving breakfast in the upper grades until um, sometimes two or possibly even three hours into the school day. And I was just wondering if that is something that over the next week, if there are considerations around how better to... Um, be able to serve those students and get the, maybe their first meal of the day uh, to them before uh, instruction um, has taken place uh, for too many hours. Hi, Heather. I am here. Um, I will tell you that in the past, the high school students really are not looking to be eating until about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, we used to do the breakfast at the very beginning of school for everyone at Hopkins. And I would have maybe two kids from the high school that would be stopping in to get their breakfast. When we started doing it around 10, 10, 20 in the morning, the percentage of students in the high school that were partaking in breakfast then, I think they were just finally awake and ready. They were hungry by that time to and really looking to eat. So I believe that April was kind of trying to keep things in the same type of schedule as we had had in the past. Okay, thank you, Diane. I can add that a little bit if you want to. So yeah, so regularly, once we switched from the, the early morning for the past I don't know how many years now, Diane, maybe you remember, but for the past few years at least, the middle school students have had their breakfast at the end of first block, which is right about at 9 a.m. And the high school students have theirs, um, what they, they normally call snack, has been at 1020 for like the last few years. So this schedule is actually earlier than they would normally have it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. My son consumes everything he can get his hands on when he wakes up. So, you know. <laughs> well, I would add one big difference uh, for all kids would be that normally they can eat throughout the day. So even though there's a time where they purchase breakfast, usually at Hopkins, unless they're in the middle of a chemistry lab or a, a high stakes assessment, right, they can eat or drink at any point. So obviously uh, that is no longer the case. And there are some notes in the plans about that because of that fact, because they're used to being able to come in with a bag of food and just sort of snack on that for hours, um, which I think Corey there might be thinking of her child. So, you know, that's kind of the usual protocol that we would have to make adjustments to and families would have to recognize too, trying to convince their children to maybe eat a little bit more at home um, as well in order to accommodate for that. And I think for me, it was more for the children who don't have that food at home, and this is really their first meal, um, that there is some allowance for them to be able to eat earlier should that need, be their need. That, that's all. I had a concern and a, and a question, and they're unrelated to that. Um, and one of them, and it might be my misunderstanding it, but April, it's for you. Um, in regards to the in-person phased um, reopening for the high school, it started out with kids being in that first phase in one cohort being the six foot distancing. I think I'm correct. But then the phase two goes into a mixed cohort and three foot distancing. So I think my concern is more around now we're lessening the distancing and we're mixing cohorts. I don't know. I know that space is challenging um, in the high school, but if there's a way, if we're starting to mix cohorts to keep kids a little bit further apart, if there's any avenues to explore. So that way we're not mixing a bunch of kids together and having them closer together. I know that's a big challenge. I, I know that would be a challenge, but any way that any avenue we can explore. Yeah, I don't have an immediate answer other than um, to get to that, to that desire would be to think a little bit more creatively. I think about 
other spaces. Um, so it's not to say that we can't, you know, when we first started, we looked at just the initial, this is the plan at, at this minimum guidance. And then we, of course, decided, you know, we like this cohort plan and it's sort of developing over time. Um, so I can certainly look at what it would take to get some of those classes either in different spaces or, um, you know, I, I know, I don't know, you know, the, the commissioner suggests using other local spaces if we can. So we can look at it and, and keep seeing what we can do in terms of numbers. One of the challenges of our class sizes is that while we have a lot of really small ones, we also tend to have uh, almost always an extraneous large one. So because of primarily the math classes that students take, uh, especially 7 through 10, sometimes into 11th and 12th grade as well. If they're on the advanced track, they take an advanced math. It ends up sort of pocketing all of those kids into one place and other kids into another. So, and, you know, we, of course, don't want to tell kids you can't take advanced math. So that's kind of the, the challenge that we're at and the fact that as they go on, they start taking, you know, this one takes AC Bio and this one takes Business Law and all of those pieces and trying to maintain that. But I will certainly continue to look at it. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I had one more, it's a challenging question and it's for Annie and uh, well, maybe it's kind of for all of you. Um, and it, um, I'm just curious, like I understand, I understand that, um, you know, our district is not starting off with a hybrid model just simply because of our student size and we don't have a problem with keeping the six foot distancing. Mm -hmm. But my question is more around why was the decision made to do um, five days, half days versus a cup. And I get the whole school lunch thing too. I, I'm, I'm absolutely in support with not having kids um, at school lunch. It creates just a whole nother complicated level, um, mm -hmm. at least in the beginning. But having a few days per week to start, like why that transition didn't start with a few days and tacking it on that way rather than the full five days and increasing by one day. I'm just curious the thought process. Sure. So one part of it is um, there was uh, a kind of initial expectation, and I think it's an understandable expectation, that to the extent to which we could demonstrate risk reduction and get as many children to school five days a week that we were charged with doing that, if teachers have for a couple of days, a cohort in front of them for the entire day. So even taking out the lunch thing, which you you know you understand and agree with, that it, it does make sense to say, let's test breakfast and then monitor this. But if teachers have children physically in front of them, a cohort on Monday and Tuesday, and then a different cohort, is that what you're suggesting on, the on, on other days, on a couple of days, they're off a couple yep. of days, yep. then um, at, where are we providing educators the time to work within Google Classroom to create meaningful remote learning experiences? Because having, having teachers, and some people have said, well, just assign some teachers to remote, but we need, in order to achieve our physical distancing targets, we need all, bodies in. We need all bodies that we have. Someone might say, well, if you did a hybrid, you don't need as many bodies, just have some remote. But as I just pointed out, that it's very easy to see groups of people end up needing to be isolated for 14 days. So we need all adults on deck. And we also thought that there was this additional benefit, as I said, students get every day 66% in person, 66% of what they would normally have, they get under the five-day model. Teachers have two hours every day to focus on designing meaningful remote learning experiences. So that's why some of that made sense. So it gave teachers time every single day, and it gave children access to in-person learning every single day. I would add one thing too um, that we also talked about, which is especially at Hopkins, this might not be as much of an issue at HES, especially at Hopkins, what we're asking the students to do in the cohort model is to come in and to sit in the same room at the same desk for four hours minus their mask break. Uh, and, and even if they can you know, stand in the room to not just be sitting there, it's obviously wildly different than what the kids are used to doing. 
So even thinking about having them do that for an extended period of time, um, I think part of our conversation was even just about like the the mental health and well-being of kids in terms of just keeping them in that one space every single day like that. I can uh, I can speak to some of what she's talking some of what Miss Caluso is talking about there with being in the same classroom for multiple class periods. Um, that definitely is not something that anyone enjoys. Um, I know that from my personal experience. Um, and trying to make it and, and trying to um, give us, you know, some additional time just to not be in that same space for um, like a, a long time and multiple days in a row is, I, I appreciate that. And I think a lot of other students will as well. And I'm glad that's something that was being thought of because it's definitely not ideal. I want to I want to say again, uh, just to echo your sentiment, Jack. We know that, like, if if I could make, and I know you know that, if I if I could make this back to normal and enjoyable for you right from the gate, uh, you have no idea how badly we want to do that. And the flip side of that is this group distancing thing that I know I sound crazed and obsessed with but I just want to monitor this so closely at the beginning. And if it turns out the mitigation strategies have the intended effect, and again, Dr. Allen has agreed that it's not overly aggressive what we're suggesting, when we can safely allow for greater movement, we will. I want you and all of your classmates and all young children to have, I want you to have band, I want you to have a wonderful year, and, um, and I want you to be safe. I know we all share that sentiment, um, Annie, for sure. So um, it is 7.30, and I'm just out of respect of everybody's time. I'd like to ask the school committee members if we may um, move to the public comment. Um, are folks okay with that? I think it's time that we do that. I'm okay with it. And before we go into open comment, um, can I just ask people? I know sometimes after open comment, it's like, oh, great, I can leave. I want to put a, a pitch in for people staying for just an extra five minutes after open comment at the very least to uh, to listen to the um, the racism um, resolution, the anti-racism resolution, and also um, some ways they can take concrete action here in the town of Hadley. So uh, just a, a heads up to not just go away. If you could please respect to that and stay to listen to that, that would be great. Thanks, Yumara. Uh, so again, I hope this dialogue was helpful to folks on the line. Um, as part of open comment, public comment, we would like you to share your feedback. We'd like to hear from you. Um, any considerations that we should be taking into, um, uh, into this next week, areas that remain uh, unclear or loose ends that we need to address uh, that are relevant to the school opening. Uh, we'd like to take this feedback that we hear from public comment. We'll work towards refined plans for all three of these scenarios, the in-person, hybrid, and 100% remote. Um, so again, just protocol. If you can raise your digital hand, I, and I'll call on um, Carrie Simos first, because uh, he, he has his digital hand up first, and I will track this um, along with uh, Corey Feltovic to make sure everybody is heard. So with that, um, Carrie Simos, there is a three minute um, limit on our comments as we said before, I'll turn it over to you, thank you. You'll just need to unmute yourself, which, there yeah. you go, got it. Yeah. You know, I'd like to, uh, you know, Carrie is my wife. Um, I'd oh, like sorry. to just, just open up and say, I think honestly, everybody on this administration owes the parents an apology. Okay. You invite us to come to this at 5.30 in the evening when I finished my job and my wife finished hers and we've got dinner and then you guys monopolize two hours of the time talking about band, talking about the cafeteria, when we've got serious issues and I think the parents who are the customers who you serve have an opportunity and should, should have an opportunity and all the time that they need. But now we're two hours into this, more than two hours. That's disrespectful. I'm sending a letter to my state rep too. Okay. Something does not add up. 
In Commissioner Riley's own letter for reopening guidance, Commissioner Riley, by the way, he cites several data points which clearly show that school-aged children do not transmit this virus to others. I was personally stunned at how low the numbers actually were. I assumed they were low, but they are practically insignificant, a source of good news, one would think. He states in his letter, schools do not appear to have played a major role in COVID transmission. In a review of COVID clusters, only 4%, which is eight out of 210, involves school transmission. In his Riley's letter as well, in a case study from New South Wales, Australia, after 18 cases were found in schools, 12 in high schools, six in primary, only 3% of student contacts were infected. One in 695, 10 high schools, and one in 160 individuals in primary schools. No teachers or staff were infected. This is my favorite one. In a case study from Ireland, after six school cases involving three students, ages 10 through 15, and three adults, there were no confirmed transmissions, despite there being over 1,000 school contacts of these individuals, both students and staff. Again, I remind you, this is all from Commissioner Riley's letter for reopening. Again, from Commissioner Riley's, Riley's letter, one infected student, nine years old in the French Alps, attended three schools while symptomatic. None of the 112 contacts became infected. Yet the rules you are suggesting our children abide by for an entire school day are, to put it mildly, oppressive. What is the message you are drilling into the children's minds? You are not safe. Your friend, peer, teacher could be a carrier. You could be a carrier. For what exactly? What is the point of school? The interpersonal relationships that we grow from do not exist with the invisible threat that you are hell-bent on reminding everyone about every second of the school day. No, no one honestly believes that peer groups or teacher-pupil bonding can thrive under these conditions. It's insanity. And I know you like to quote Harp. At this three minutes. I know you like to quote Harvard, but even in, in a Stanford uh, study, global hotspots, the scientists found that the risk of death for the general population, school and working age is typically the range of a daily car ride to work. The risk was initially overestimated because people with mild or no symptoms were not taking Excuse them. me, Carrie, at this point, I am going to have to go ahead and mute you. Thank you for your comments, but you've exceeded the three minute limit. Of course, of course. thank you. You thank guys you. take two hours. I'd like to call on Emily Pfeiffer next. All right. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you, Emily. So first, I just wanted to say thanks so much to everyone who's working so hard on this. I know there's no ideal solution, and there are a lot of varying needs to manage. Um, I know you've been charged with developing these specific plans, and I know that at some point a decision does have to be made. So uh, the Massachusetts Teachers Association is pushing really hard for remote learning and not to reopen schools, and we as a family also feel that despite the state's guidance, remote learning should be prioritized more than it currently is because... A significant portion of the community responded in the survey that they're definitely or probably opting for remote. I think it was about 30% of the total respondents at the time they were surveyed, as Paul was saying earlier. But the cases are beginning to climb again in Massachusetts, and um, I'm sure that these preferences will continue to shift. So as the cohorts or classes or individuals become infected or are exposed, they'll move to remote also when they're quarantined. And because teachers and administrators somehow created an amazing impromptu remote learning process in about a minute and a half last spring, and I, I don't understand how everybody transitioned that quickly then, and, and it was amazing that what happened did. But now with the time to develop remote teaching skills and invest in technology to support it and reach out to the families most at risk, not only would we be better prepared, but families would have the opportunity to better understand what remote education might look like in a, a, a better situation and to realize that it could be a much more positive experience than the emergency measures that were pulled together so quickly in the spring. So as Humara said earlier, and I agree, remote learning can be a much more positive experience, but only if it's prioritized and intentionally developed now. So why I think it's important, we think it's important to encourage remote learners also is because if as many students as possible, as can stay home, choose to stay home, 
It reduces the risk for everyone, especially those who are in the building. It further reduces the risk of spread in the community. It keeps more students distanced. There are a lot of perfectly valid reasons why families need or prefer for their students to be in school, and I get that. It's a difficult decision that families all need to make for themselves. We recognize that some students simply need the supervision that in-person learning offers. For our family, the challenges of missing socialization don't compare for us to the risk of exposure. But we also recognize that we're privileged to be able to work from home and have our child at home with us. There's only one, she's in eighth grade. It's, it's, uh, it's easier for us than it is for others. So. Um, as some districts around the country have already decided, minimizing in-person learners would also allow teachers to be remote if they chose to. If there's supervision in the schools, then the teachers themselves can provo provide remote learning only, and it would be received simultaneously to students in school with a supervisor and at home. Far be it from me to speak to what our teachers want, but I have to imagine that some would invite the option to stay out of the buildings. Um, I wanted to let people know that I've formed a Facebook group for Hadley families who are considering keeping their students at home. It's called Hadley at Home. You don't have to be committed to the decision yet, but, uh, and Hadley educators and administrators are also very welcome to join. But so the I'm purpose sorry to interrupt to you, Emily. I just want to let you know that that's the three minutes. If you want to just, um, I believe you can, Heather, can you clarify? Can they raise their hands and come back? Um, I'd like to make sure everybody is heard first. And okay. then. Fair enough. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, we do have, um, sorry, I'm trying to turn off my timer too. Um, we have uh, Lisa Giddens now. Lisa, Giddens. Lisa, I think that I just unmuted you. Lisa? Okay. Thank you. You can hear me, I think. Hi. Um, I was happy to hear your communication kind of around the airflow in the institution or in the school. And specifically, um, I have a fifth grader. And if I'm understanding the plan currently, all of the fifth graders would be in the gym. Um, and so I was curious and uh, I was hoping somebody could speak a little bit more to the safety measures in terms of airflow specifically in the gym. Um, I mean, there's some other concerns with 40 of them altogether. The numbers for the other grades are 15 or less per class. Um, so I know there are several parents that I've talked to that are very concerned about this. So I just wanted to see if, and, and Jen, I'm happy to talk to you off, offline um, if you can give me more information, but I just I wanted to articulate that and, and hear about kind of the modifications that could be made to an echoey gym to really have that be a quality learning environment for our students. Um, you know, the students that are on IEPs for distractions, for ADD, for all of the pieces. Um, and specifically, I did have a little bit of concern around if the airflow exchange is only happening twice per hour. Um, I, I was under the impression that it needed to be more frequently than that. Um, and that's I'm going to hold a separate fifth grade meeting to address. Awesome that because we do have some other options so but i can email those parents in i think that'd be great i know that i've i, I actually some of them have even written me saying hey i can't be there i'm moving whatever can you please Same people me? contacted me so we're all on the same okay. page all right and emily i just want to um thank you for your work as it relates to hadley at home and communicate that i do think that's a great option that many of us also need to explore so thank you i know i'm under my three minutes Thank you, Lisa. And um, I, I like your, I appreciate your suggestion about, uh, we know we're going to incorporate information about air filtration as Paul summarized, but you specifically mentioned the gym, which I think is a great point given it is a different configuration. It's a different size than a typical classroom. So um, Paul, I'm going to ask if, if we can have some attention to that um, different environments, the cafe, the gym, um, anything like that, that's not quite the traditional classroom. Yeah, Thank definitely. You. We've been thinking about it. I don't have a good answer right now, as you can imagine, right? If you're talking about the, just the cubic volume of air in there and recirculating. So really what you're going to have to focus on is bringing in outside air to a sufficient quality. That's going to be your first, your first goal. All right. Just to make sure you get that 20% coming in. Uh, if you have further information on air exchange rates, there's different ways of communicating. Mm -hmm. become somewhat of a minor expert on this it's it's highly convoluted and, and complex you've got your your cater you've got your merv you've got your air exchange rate per hour and there isn't clear data there aren't clear data on what exactly is needed um so if you've got anything i'd be happy to look at it that'd be great thank you thank uh, you cdc and folks like that there is there aren't clear guidance mm -hmm. uh, guidelines i'd like to call on christine kelly next Hi, my question, I don't know if I missed this, um, is about after school. 
are we still going to have some sort of after school care? Because now if school is ending at one, those of us who rely on after school care are going to be even in more of an issue. I have two little ones at home and I either have to hire someone and now have to pay someone out of pocket to watch them, which is a, a great expense. Um, daycares have limited room right now, so they might not be able to get in for after school and daycares. And we're a two income household. And so reducing our hours is going to be a very big challenge for us. So any thoughts on aftercare for the elementary school, at least? Thank you for the question. So uh, I did not see after school care addressed currently in the plans. My question um, really to Annie, or um, perhaps this goes to Jennifer, given that the after school care is done at the elementary school, um, is there uh, a future placeholder for that uh, as part of this plan, or is that a separate thing since it is not typically uh, considered part of, is it part of school reopening? I don't know. It would be a future uh, placeholder. It's not, it's not considered a part of school reopening, but it would be, we understand that families use our Hadley Kids program. So it is part of a future placeholder. And there's some things that we have to go through in terms of how, how could we do that and how could we keep kids with the same expectations that we're trying to impose during the school day. Thank you. Um, we do have two participants that are on the phone and may be unable to raise their digital hand. I just want to give uh, a minute to offer them the opportunity if they would like to participate in public comment before we go back to Emily. Uh, so there were two numbers on here. Uh, the first one ending in zero. Hello. Zero. Yes. This is Susan By. I had called in because I wasn't home, and now I'm I'm in both. Um, I did have a question about if we do start out with remote learning. Um, I know it was a little difficult for uh, my older son in high school um, or middle school that the some of the classes were not taught, um, say, by the, the teachers would say, I have a Zoom meeting at this time. If you would like to sign up, you can. I didn't feel for my son that's not something that worked for him. He's the one who needs to be told, this is the time that we're meeting for class today and you need to show up. Is that something, if we do do remote learning, that will be um, more scheduled for the Zoom meetings? Yeah, I appreciate your, your public comment, um, Susan. And um, yes, I think from some of the earlier dialogue and discussion around this um, future remote learning looking different than what the spring um, you know, with the quick shift uh, look like in terms of the schedule of the day and the process for holding those those regular class periods. Um, but with that, I'll I'll um, ask if anyone else would like to contribute to that. So um, there is a requirement even from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, whether we are 100% remote or some students are electing remote, that we are tracking attendance, that there is grading, that we are tracking engagement. Um, so it is very different than what the department expected in the spring and the parameters and the uh, guidelines the department set forth in the spring. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, the other participant from on the phone has uh, either renamed themselves or have dropped. So uh, if, are there any other um, public comment participants uh, before we move back to Emily? Go ahead, Robin. Hi, um, I just first want to start off by saying that I just admire the school system wholeheartedly. Um, and the teachers, superintendents, paras, everybody that stepped up in March to provide what they did for our children is absolutely 100% remarkable. And you all are just truly special, special people. Um, it probably comes as no surprise. I have some medical sort of concerns um, as being a nurse. And um, 
they're about the cohorts and the grouping and I get it. And I think that's actually a great idea. And I get the mixing of the cohorts. You know, we really need to try to keep that, the cohort separate. What happens if your child is with another child and there's an issue in the cohorts? Have you guys thought about a plan on how to um, mediate that? Um, my other question is, is there a space available in both Hopkins and the elementary school for suspected COVID cases? Um, I also had another question in regards to the gym, but Lisa did a fabulous job. And now I know that we'll all be talking. I feel I, my trust is in you. I, I trust all of you to make the right decision for our children. Um, the other question I had was, um, the nurses seem like they're going to have their hands full. I know they are. One cough, sneeze, sniffle, especially with the younger kids who are going to have a more particularly difficult time keeping their masks on. I feel as though they're going to get overwhelmed. The teachers are going to get overwhelmed. Of course, staffing is an issue. We all know that. We all know we could try to bring in more staff. The same thing with the nursing profession in the hospital. So has there been any discussion about any volunteers? And I know we want to keep the numbers in the school down. And I get that, of course. But we're talking about adults that can help out, that know how to keep masks on, know how to do really good hand washing, know not to touch their outside of their masks. Have we thought about somebody walking around like a monitor to help the teachers? I, I, I just feel, especially in the younger grades, there's going to be a lot of, please put your mask on, stay your distance. And it's 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 going to take a toll. Then you kind of wonder how much time they're actually going to be able to do the things they really want to do with these children. Um, so I don't know if there's like a group of parents that can kind of get together to help with the more of the health concerns. Um, maybe I'm just thinking this way because I'm particularly engaged with it and I obviously have a passion for it. Um, so those were my questions. Thank you. So I appreciate you bringing up um, topics around, and these are things that we can expand on in the plan around if there are social issues within a cohort was one of the yeah. things we heard. Um, yeah. the, just clarifying the space in the schools that are designated as that isolation area, because those are mentioned in the plans, but we can be specific about that. Um, and just a position on, you know, capacity and volunteers and support what that what that may look like. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, Jeanette. Hi, thank you so much. Really appreciate what everybody's doing um, and the opportunity to be here. Hopefully this is an easy one. I just have a question about the room assignments on the Hadley Elementary um, plan. And it had indicated that um, you know, like four classes for kindergarten, and then there's like additional for first, second, um, and fourth, et cetera. So who are, who is teaching those or how is that, how is that happening? So my understanding is class assignments have not yet been made, but Jennifer, do you want to add to that? Yes, certainly, especially in kindergarten. Um, right now, what we have is a kindergarten teacher with a full-time paraprofessional, um, and they work almost in unison together in the classroom. So what I did was I moved the first grade out so that I could have an open door in between the two classrooms. So this would allow sufficient spacing in between the kids. We know our kindergartners are going to struggle probably the most um, as far as, well, preschool too, but just keeping masks on and, and kind of being in their space and not wanting to touch each other and climb over each other and grab things off bookshelves. So we wanted to make sure that there was enough space. So I'm, I haven't done all the staffing assignments yet. Um, 
Another thing is that we also have some additional support since the specialists are going to be teaching remotely at the end of the day. I will have some extra people um, in the building. I have to look at our ESPs. I'm working very hard with Pam Haywood, who's our um, director of student services. So we're going to try to make sure that we have an ESP or a paraprofessional in those overlying classrooms, but that the teachers will still have those students and they are responsible for their education. They are responsible for their learning. They are responsible for their assignments. Um, so just as though they would have 20 kids in front of them, they would only maybe have eight in front of them, but they're still responsible for the learning um, of those other children. So it's going to, it's going to call on all hands on deck. Everybody's going to be help, helping out as much as possible. I'm hoping to get um, a clearer picture once we understand who is coming back. Um, you know, what, what families are choosing to send their children that will drive our numbers that will drive our classroom. My priority is fifth grade, because I know that the gym is not an ideal space, um, especially for that many children. I still have an open cafe. Um, we haven't assigned anybody in that space. So we do have some flexibility. I'm hoping that the numbers and staff and children will, will help drive some of those decisions. But it's a great question. It comes up a lot. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Jeanette, for asking the question. Um, Emily, we'll come back to you then um, to close out our public comment on this item. Thanks. I thought I could talk fast, but I guess not that fast. Um, so the Hadley at Home Facebook group, the idea is to create a community for the families of remote learners so we can support each other, minimize feelings of isolation, buddy up children, and ease the transition for new remote learners as they move to remote as a result of quarantining or choice over the course of the year. Um, I, I haven't heard very clear plans for regular interaction for remote learners. I understand the, the everybody's remote plan, but the we've chosen to be remote, but some are in school. I'm just not clear on how much access, if any, remote learners would have to their teachers, whether they'd have scheduled lessons, like Susan Bai was saying. Um, and, and currently, as, as Tara said earlier, choosing to stay remote does not currently feel like, or it does currently feel like it would be a loss of, of quality of education. So I'm, I'm concerned for the students who remain remote, but it sounds to me right now they'd be 100% independent learners. I understand Google Classroom, but I feel like they would be giving up the right to real-time guidance or interaction with their teachers, and I hope that's not the, the, the case. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, families that need to keep their students remote should not be homeschooling, right? It, it should still be remote learning that's, depending on their age, being guided as much as possible by the school. And again, over time, it's all but guaranteed that more and more students will move to remote as cohorts or groups are exposed. Families may choose to move that way. The disruption of these changes would be minimized if all students had a more similar experience, regardless of where they receive it. The experience of Hadley's remote learners if schools are otherwise open deserves more attention, in our opinion, than it's currently receiving. If we're being realistic about how the school year will look and how to do as much as we can to reduce the risk for our community. That's all, thanks. Thanks, Emily. So um, a takeaway from that, as well as from Susan Bai's comment, is to be uh, a little bit more specific about even with the in-person return to school plan for those families that choose to have their children remain at home and do remote learning, um, just what that model looks like specifically. Um, so that will take that as a takeaway. Thank you. Uh, Humera, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to um, add to that. I think um, in summary, remote learning cannot be substandard when in-person in -person learning is taking place. It just cannot be. There are families that have um, uh, illnesses at home, comorbidities. It is um, not an option for them to send their children out into the world and um, we, we can't treat it as though, um, as a parent, I would say, we cannot treat it as though, uh, well, school is in session, therefore Google Classroom is an afterthought. But now that we're all remote, because we have to be, because we've let the cat out of the bag and there's an infection running rampant through Hadley, now we can be really diligent about Google Classroom. It just cannot be that way. It can't, we can, it can't be a win-lose situation. We have to create a win-win situation for, for everyone. If we want schools to be a situation where there's parenting, because 
let's face it, this is a workforce issue, right? People can't go back to work. And just because it's a workforce issue or, or an equity issue, it, it can't mean that, uh, that all those other people lose out. So we just have to have parity across the board. Thanks, Yamira. Okay, I'm going to um, move from public comment then uh, into, um, there is no action item on this. Obviously, um, as mentioned before, we're not voting on plans right now. We really do appreciate everybody's insights, their input, their feedback, the questions we've received here, the questions we've received over the last few months, um, because they've really helped guide us, shape these plans, um, as, and they will continue to take shape. So we appreciate that. Um, and look forward to bringing them back uh, next week. So uh, with that, I think I, what I need to do then is move into item 4B, which is the diversity, inclusion, anti-racism and equity um, uh, enclosure. Uh, we're gonna have an update on um, the community activities and uh, discussions and then discuss the anti-racism resolution. Annie, are you or Humera leading this discussion? Uh, if Humera, if you were willing to do that, that would be wonderful. Would you I, like I, to? Yeah, I'm happy to great. do that, yes. Thank um, you. So thank you for staying to hear this portion. I promise I will make it quick. Um, we have in the, uh, let's see, the first item is the update on community activities and discussion. So when all this went down, um, there was a lot of um, hurt and angst and feeling um, that, uh, and the community needed a place to heal. And we held a conversation about race. And there was uh, about 35 people. There were um, a lot, there were a few, there were a few people of color, students and, and um, community members alike, uh, educators, and a lot of um, uh, non uh, people of color, so white people. And it mirrored the town of Hadley. There was really good sharing and discussion about uh, what is, what is life really like in Hadley for people of color? I think it really opened people's eyes. And that sparked an agreement that we really needed to have a book discussion uh, or start there at least. And so we had our first book discussion. Um, we, uh, people, there was a, a vote and people selected a, a book and that went really well. Great discussion. Um, and uh, you know, it's important to note that we've had parents, students, educators, We've had elected officials, we've had people from the police department. And so we're moving on to the next phase of community um, discussion, learning and action. So I have a very short presentation here. If you haven't gotten engaged and you want to, you should go to bit.ly forward slash Hadley learns. Bit.ly forward slash Hadley learns. That is the next opportunity to get engaged in a book discussion and a conversation about action. And this is important because after stuff like this happens in the world, people forget. They forget how important it is to take action locally, right? All action happens locally. We can influence change by talking about what happens in Hadley and influence change around the state. So this is our second book discussion and it is on now, I understand that it's August, Sunday, August 2nd. I understand it's a Sunday, but this is important because people's lives are at stake, right? So if you care, then you will make time. It's 9.30 to 11 on Sunday. And how is that structured? Well, there's a 45 minute book discussion and there are two book options. One, think of it like a starter, a white fragility uh, book discussion in a breakout room in Zoom. That's like a starter. If you've never had a conversation about race, that's a great place to start. And the other is how to be an anti-racist. This is an incredible book. And uh, there'll be another group of people who have never read that. Now, if you don't have time to read a book between now and Sunday, like you can if you uh, get an audible audiobook, then I will give you a 90 minute video that you can watch. And it's just as good and it'll allow you to participate in a conversation. So 45 minutes, do not let the reading of a book be a barrier. And then the next 45 minutes, people have signed up for different teams based on their priorities. So if you care about your kids knowing about um, anti-racist curriculum, right? How can you go through the world not knowing about Juneteenth until you're an adult, right? It's ridiculous. 
or, uh, or Tulsa or Oklahoma or Rosewood or whatever. Um, so if you are interested in taking action, be it for K-12, for safety, for training and hiring of people in school in, in our town, for uh, leading another book discussion, or simply just people. What is the experience of people of color in our town? Or what is, uh, or, or getting more people to the table? Perhaps you know there's a large community of white people who are like, I'm colorblind. Well, there really is no such thing. That's where racism breeds. Then you can engage in discussion and, and like spark a conversation. You can send people out who um, are familiar to ha lead that conversation. So there's action taking place on all of these different fronts. You don't have to be an activist, you know, like I'm not an activist, but you just have to be someone who cares. And if you care, then you will go here and sign up. And so you can attend the first part on the book discussions, or you can attend the second part, or you can attend both, but just sign up so I know who you are and I can put you in the right bucket of what you care about. And then you can partner up with other collaborators, not elected officials. There's no committees. We do things a little bit more on the down low in order to get things done. Thanks. That's that part. There's an anti-racism resolution in your packet. It had a lot of back and forth with people in the community that care about Black Lives Matter as well as indigenous lives and other um, people of color. And so um, I'd like to motion that my um, team, my school committee members, um, pass that resolution in support of um, our school district and our community. Um, taking a stand against racism. Thanks, Kimara. And I'd like to just comment that when we initially brought this to the school committee, um, that this is a really a statewide initiative that has been undertaken by many school districts within the state uh, to support, um, to, to pass or, you know, fine tune whatever it may be for their particular district, an anti-racism resolution. And so, um, I, I would support that motion. Let me ask the other members if they have any input um, or our student representative as well. Um, I support it wholeheartedly. And I actually just want to thank you, Humira, for putting the effort and enthusiasm and getting the community um, involved in this and looking to engage parents to help teach our students now, um, rather than waiting and experiencing, sometimes Hadley is a small town, experiencing it for the first time in college and being uneducated and unaware. So thank you for stepping up and taking the time. I know that everyone's lives are busy. So it it means a lot as a parent, not just a school committee member, as a parent that you're taking this time and taking the lead um, to get parents together to discuss this. So I support it. Um, okay. oh, go ahead, Jack. Oh, thank you. Um, I haven't actually, I did not receive a copy of this statement, but I do, uh, I, I do want to say that I support it because um, in my peers, there's, Definite, there's a lot of people who are very knowledgeable and who care quite a bit about the Black Lives Matter movement. And then there are also people who throughout the years I have known to say ignorant or racist or harmful things. Um, sort of, you know, in like in closed circles. And I think that it's really important that Hopkins does take a stand against that. And I've also seen... Um, even even with more even more recently still a lot of ignorance about certain things um so i i just it's a it's a very commendable effort and i think it's really something that we need to do to take a definitive stance um against that kind of behavior and against those ideas so thank you for doing that i, I 100 percent support it yeah and i was just going to say the same thing i'm 100 percent on board and and to this point the community conversations have been great and i definitely encourage all of you guys to to sign up and attend uh this sunday or whenever you can it's it's very important work that we're we're trying to do here yes thank you humera i appreciate it uh, very much so and i'm thrilled to see this back with us uh, for this motion and approval. So I'll just ask the committee if there is a motion and a, and a second. I motion to accept it. Thank second. you. All in favor. Aye. 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 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Humara, for pushing this over the finish line and um, really giving it the care and attention that it needed. It's much appreciated. Thank uh, you. I just, I just want to add my thanks to this committee for being supportive and for this community to be supportive. And I just want to acknowledge Jack, um, your words. Um, I, you know, there. We have a lot of pride and love in this community, and there are a lot of well-meaning people who just don't know. They just don't know. And it's our opportunity to help them understand other people's perspectives, because if they knew, they would be doing things differently. So we have to have patience and love and care and send these young uh, adults out into the world equipped with, uh, that knowledge. So it's it, the opportunity is ours. Thank you, team. Thank you. All right, uh, we have come to the wonderful uh, area of action items on the warrants. So <laughs> uh, is there a motion to approve the accounts payable warrants that were submitted in June 2020? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain from the vote. Uh, is there a motion to approve the warrants that were submitted in June 2020? So moved. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Just want to recap. Um, we have a fun filled month ahead of us of many meetings, <laughs> lots of dialogue, um, and we look forward to that. We look forward to being able to work with the community as well. So August 6th, uh, we'll be here to review and do the final approval of the reopening plans. Uh, and that really should be a plural because we have three of them. Um, and then August 24th, 2020, we will review and revise the district strategy document and the superintendent goals. That's our retreat um, <laughs> via Zoom. And then August 31st, we will have our regular school committee meeting. Um, in the interim, I, I know and I trust that... Um, uh, Annie and her team, uh, Jennifer, April, you guys have been in co constant communication with um, uh, public and um, parents, families. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to those continued communications as we work through a really important um, period of time here before reopening. So thank you very much for that. Any other comments before we adjourn the meeting? I just want to say thanks to everybody for sticking it through this um, almost three hour meeting. And thank you, Heather, for facilitating. You did a great job. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. And, and thanks Heather, if, if it's, uh, I would just like to make sure that I heard everything correctly. So here's the summary of the feedback I heard that people really want to see us flesh out of these plans. Uh, to pay particular attention to remote learning that was underscored multiple times to make sure that regardless of whether or not the entire district is in remote learning or if there are for the families who choose it, that we pay very close attention to um, and be as specific as possible as to what it looks like in terms of frequency of interaction uh, with educators, the type of that interaction and what families can expect. Um, that phase two at Hopkins Academy, we do make every effort to maintain physical distancing, um, that we provide more information on airflow, particularly in learning spaces that are repurposed like the gym and other spaces, um, that we um, provide information about after school care, what those options would be and what that might look like, um, that we have, we address how there would be cohort changes under what conditions and what that might look like. We consider the strategic and safe use, use of parent volunteers um, and that we provide as much information as possible on room assignments and corresponding supervision. And I did hear from a member of the public uh, a concern that we've placed too much emphasis on um, uh, restriction and cohorting. Yeah, I had the same list. Um, the only addition I had was also just um, a little bit more information about the space designated as the isolation space. Oh, thank you. Medical waiting room. Yep. No worries. Thank you. There was uh, also okay. Oh, uh, Jason Sorry, Burton also mentioned about the um, HEA survey that uh, he, he was going to send some information, which I believe he sent along that we can share um, 
at our next meeting in terms okay. of distribution of that survey. Okay. Did you, Annie, did you also include the grade five meeting um, just for HES? If you wanted to add that as a side note, because uh, okay. there is a, a concerned group of parents, rightfully so. So I just want to um, carve out some time and Paul, you've done some great work and maybe you could even join us and give us some of your expertise. That would be great. Be happy to, yeah. Okay, thanks. All is the air guy, uh, new designation. So Annie, did you, I'm sorry, I might have missed it. Did you also mention the aftercare question? There was the comment, I think about- Yes, uh, yes. With nursing, nursing volunteers. That was an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. I do have that on the list. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that sounds like a good recap. Um, the meeting minutes will be much easier <laughs> with having. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else before we adjourn? Okay. With that, I'd like to uh, get a motion to adjourn the Hadley School Committee meeting. So moved. Okay. Seconded. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night.